Welcome to the day two of the second meeting um, of the Committee on Increasing Diversity in the U.S. Ocean Studies. Um, I do see some new uh, names online, so um, I'm going to take a few minutes just to talk through um, what the study is, um, and, uh, and then we'll get on with the agenda. So for those who are new to the National Academies, um, we were first established by President Lincoln. Um, we are now the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, referred to as NASM. Um, we're nonprofit organizations with a mission to provide evidence-based, unbiased advice on matters of scientific importance to the nation. We produce over 200 reports a year. Um, some of the reports on this cover are those from the Ocean Studies Board, which is where I work. Um, and we also have other types of convening activities. Um, and all of this work is done by um, our volunteer experts that we call on. Um, the work is generally funded by the government. Um, some are legislatively mandated, others are commissioned by an agency. This particular study was um, developed by the actual Ocean Studies Board. It was a topic that we feel very passionately about. We developed the statement of task, which I'll get to in a second, and then, um, and then presented it to different funders um, to get the support to do this work. Um, yeah, so we, we also do work for nonprofit institutions and industry or any organization looking for objective independent advice. Um, next slide. So this is our statement of task. Um, we'll put a link to the project website in the chat. Um, there's a lot of words here. Um, I just wanna point out that we are, we're looking at um, policies and strategies, evidence-based practices for increasing diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, accessibility, and justice in U.S. Ocean Studies community with an emphasis on increasing racial and ethnic diversity. Um, we're doing this through a collection of existing narratives. We may be collecting additional narratives. Um, we're looking at analysis of policy, strategies, and practices of, of past programs and current programs, both in ocean studies and also in STEM. Um, we're looking to develop a coordinated strategy across ocean studies um, to increase um, diversity, uh, ethnic and racial diversity in ocean studies. So this is not just for federal governments, but for anyone employing ocean scientists. Um, and then uh, and lastly, we'll be identifying metrics to evaluate progress towards this goal. Um, the quick overview is this is a 24, oh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a 24 month consensus study. Um, consensus, <laughs> consensus means that um, the, the report uh, that we publish is authored by the full committee. We're all, all 15 members are behind um, the conclusions and recommendations that are presented. Um, we have four sponsors, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Office of Naval Research, and the National Science Foundation. Um, I think I've got a, a list of the committee members on the next page, but all of that information is um, on our website. You can download their bios and read more about them. Um, and then we'll accomplish this work through a series of four hybrid two-day meetings, plus monthly meetings, and then plus subcommittee meetings. Um, so those hybrid meetings, this is the second one. Um, we'll have another one in October and then a final one to, to reach consensus, um, I think in February. Um, and then we'll have our report peer reviewed and released in the summer of 2025. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, so this is the list of our awesome committee. Um, again, you can, you can read all about them on our website. We've got the bios posted there. Next slide. Um, and this is our project timeline. I think I kind of already went through these, but um, we, we announced and approved our committee in January. We had our first meeting in March. Um, we've now having our second. Um, we'll continue to meet over the next year and a half and go through the whole peer review process um, and delivery of report in the summer of 2025. Um, and then this is my last quick overview slide. Um, next Next page. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, please stay up to date. So we're we're really hoping to build the community that provides input into this study um, and that helps us, um, you know, take those recommendations into real action that makes a difference. Um, so please do stay up to date with what we're doing. You can add your email um, where that purple circle is, um, and then you'll join a, a mailing list. 
Um, my email is listed there on the slide as well. Um, if you have anything you'd like to share with the committee, always reach out. Um, and uh, we're, we, we'd are we love to hear from you. So um, I think that's all I have. If you have any questions, again, please reach out. And I'm now going to turn it over to Wendy Todd, our committee member who is moderating this first session today. Wendy, the floor is yours. Oh, hello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, today we have um, speaking on inclusion for Native and Indigenous communities in ocean studies. Um, Sarah, Dr. Sarah Ahrens and uh, Dr. Melissa Peacock joining us. Um, are they on here? I don't see them. Wendy, that's um, later. Oh, in... that's the one I have. I'm sorry. We're starting with um, veterans in ocean studies with Manson Brown and Paxton Calhoun. Ooh, okay, I misunderstood the assignment. Let me go back, I apologize. Give me just a second here then. I thought I was just doing one part. All right, let me start over. <laughs> we have um, speaking on about veterans is uh, Manson Brown, a uh, retired uh, U.S. Coast Guard Vice Admiral and public official, and Paxton Calhoun, um, a U.S. Army veteran and current NOAA veteran, Conservation Corps intern with NOAA Northwest Fisheries Science Center. Are they on? Yeah, I'm on. Professor one. Todd, this is Manson. I'm here. Okay. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Um, we have a, a series of questions that we were that were sent to you. And I'll start with asking you, uh, going down some of those and just asking, um, have you experienced any challenges, barriers, or supports in your pursuit of your careers? I can start, Wendy. Um, first, let me just summarize uh, my background a little bit for everybody. I am a retired executive. My education, advanced education, is in civil engineering and national resources strategy. I only had two jobs in my life, 36 years with the Coast Guard and two years uh, during the second half of the Obama administration as a at the Department of Commerce. Uh, you know, in the Coast Guard, we do three things. We focus on maritime safety, security, and stewardship. As an assistant secretary at Commerce, I worked in NOAA and I also served as NOAA's deputy administrator. There I worked on satellite ships, all of the things we use to collect data and the process of converting that data into useful forecasts. During that time, uh, I was the primary architect for an effort led by Kathy Sullivan to enhance organizational culture at NOAA with a special focus on DNI. And during my off duty time, I'm a past national president of the largest affinity group focused on enhancing diversity for sea services officers. So I wanted to offer that as, uh, as, as background. As to your question, challenges, barriers, and supports, I'll be straight up with you. Early in my career, I uh, experienced a few distressing episodes where a few individuals deliberately were inconsiderate, disrespectful, and sometimes even hateful towards me. Um, some made it clear that I didn't belong in what they used to term their Coast Guard. Sometimes they uh, were threatening towards me. I felt unsafe. Sometimes they were offensive to me. I felt unwelcome. Sometimes they were uncaring towards me and I felt like I wasn't being nurtured. And many times I felt like the organization didn't value my talents. And so I felt like I was, wasn't being professionally challenged. A lot of this was intended to get me to leave the Coast Guard. And, you know, I, I went through some lessons learned. I learned to control my rage. And I decided I wasn't gonna let the haters win. I decided to let my performance prove them wrong. Um, and I also decided I wasn't gonna tolerate, particularly as I got more senior, similarly destructive behavior towards anyone else. And so, I made it my mantra 
um, to find, fix, or fire so-called leaders who weren't getting it done for those people. And I enjoyed serving in six commands during my time with the Coast Guard and had to terminate a lot of folks, some of my friends. So my perspective as a leader is that everybody deserves a safe, welcoming, nurturing, and professionally challenging work environment. And I established these as the four essential work and workers' rights that framed my leadership philosophy for most of my career. As to supports, fortunately for me, I, I, re I received tons of support from peers, mentors, and supervisors. And it always warmed my heart, particularly early in my career, when countless subordinates would come up to me and say something like, we need you to stay, Mr. Brown, because they saw me as hope for the future for them. And so I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, Paxton, do you want to take a minute to introduce yourself and then answer? Uh, I can repeat the question for you if you'd like. Hi, uh, thanks, Wendy. Um, my name's Paxton Calhoun. Uh, I just recently left the United States Army in 2022 after serving as a correctional officer for seven years. Um, I am currently working with NOAA through the Veteran Conservation Corps um, and soon to be contractor with NOAA. And uh, and yeah, and so I just recently entered the world of fisheries. Um, but any any challenges uh, in the pursuit of my career, I I would say the lack of work experience, um, you know, throughout throughout my time, I especially entering the environmental world, uh, I was, you know, like I said, a correctional officer, and there wasn't really a lot of opportunities to uh, experience environmental science. Um, so I kind of started my career uh, in the Army with pursuing a bachelor's in criminal justice. And then, you know, it was because of a position within a, the jail as like working with horticulture and agriculture that I, my passions changed and I started pursuing a bachelor's in environmental science instead. Um, I would also say, like I said, the lack of work experience coming out of the army in the environmental world definitely felt like it hindered me, um, especially going because I'm pursuing my master's in environmental studies currently. And uh, yeah, and I feel like, you know, I entered the field with very little work experience and um, also pursuing my education while active duty soldier uh, that was pretty difficult as well, um, especially because ocean studies, I feel like, is a very niche thing. And I was stationed in Kansas, and there are very little uh, ocean studies programs, especially um, on post, that you can go to in person. So when I started pursuing my master's, I, you know, I had no lab experience, in-person lab experience, uh, no uh, you know, no experience in the field. So I felt like I was very behind in ocean studies and, you know, environmental science in general. So, uh, you know, in, in pursuit of my career, uh, a support that I feel like uh, supported me was the um, Army Career Skills Program, where it helps transitioning veterans or transitioning military personnel to enter the workforce uh, to start internships. And I did that with Joint Base Lewis McCord Fish and Wildlife, and I was able to get some field experience before leaving the military uh, and then entering my master's program. So I feel like that was a big help. And also, um, you know, the Veteran Conservation Corps, just nonprofits here in Washington State that's actively seek out veterans that want to enter this uh, environmental field um, has been a huge help and has helped put me into the position of getting a, a contracting position with NOAA uh, that, I mean, these two uh, nonprofits have helped me help further my career. Thank you so much. Um, Manson, I want to um, build on what you were talking about um, and tying that into the second question, you had talked about um, the challenges of being um, unwelcoming and non-nurturing environment. 
Uh, what do you believe helped you overcome those challenges? Um, some of that was internal. Um, you know, I'll just give you a quick set of numbers. Uh, my academy class, we started with 22 African-Americans out of a total of 400. Um, and we only graduated six um, out of a total of 167 graduates. Uh, I was the only one to stay past the five-year initial commitment. And as I talk with my peers from that class, I think the difference is that I just had this resolve. I mean, I, I was pretty enraged through my early experiences. And, you know, if you let rage consume you, uh, you allow the way the haters to win. And so that thought kept resonating in my mind. And I just hung in there, hung in there, hung in there. And, uh, you know, I would say for the first 10 years of my career, I came to work to make a living. But there was a turning point at that time that really changed everything for me and it changed the trajectory of my career. I had a majority male commanding officer uh, reach out to me. I was initially distrusting because of my prior experiences with majority males, but he was persistent and he was all also patient. And so over time, I sensed that he was authentic and that he really wanted to get closer to me. And, um, for the first time in my career, I felt like I was in my commanding officer's inner circle. And what I later learned is that um, that was his leadership style. Everybody at that command felt that way. And, you know, I could talk all day about Commander Greg McGee, but let me just give you some of the impacts that came out from my personal relationship and his leadership style throughout the command. I talked about shifting from making a living to making a difference. I really felt I had a different view of what my role was in the Coast Guard after my experience with, with Greg McGee. My performance, I was an average performer before that. My performance skyrocketed after that and stayed that way for the remainder of my career. Um, I adopted Greg McGee's authentic leadership style and uh, probably rose to the high rank that I did because of that. Um, it really is what Maya Angelou says. Um, people won't remember what you did or even what you say. They'll always rem remember how you made them feel. That's what I think about when I think about Greg McGee. Our unit won the National Engineering Award two years in a row. Um, and most significantly for me, I changed the way that I engaged with majority males. I grew up in DC in an all black community. I was programmed to distrust majority males until they proved to be trustworthy. Because of Greg McGee, I shifted the dynamic so that I trusted you until you proved to be untrustworthy. And I remembered that for the remainder of my career. And that shift was quite liberating for me. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, a a major foundational shift in how we engage with the world, right? So that good mentorship, that sincere, authentic mentorship made all the difference. Thank you. Um, Paxton, you talked a little bit about um, what helped you overcome those barriers and getting into other programs that were bringing you into this field. So I'll ask you um, an opposing question of what served to hinder your advancement Well, I would hinder my advancement. I would just say that the the lack of lack of work experience and just my own self, uh, um, my own thoughts were hindering my advancement too. Just in that, um, I just had imposter syndrome for a while. Uh, I still do at some points uh, in this in this field just because I feel like I'm coming into it um uh, later in life um 
and not even later in life. I just turned 27, but I just feel like people uh, here in Washington just get a jump on their careers early, especially in ocean studies or environmental science. So I um, <clears throat> I definitely think that's that's one of the the key reasons my work experience and then um, just the imposter syndrome of not feeling like I, I belong in this field. Um, uh, ex yeah, especially coming from a correctional officer background. Um, so, so yeah, that's, um, that's what I feel like has hindered, hindered me. Thank you. So it sounds like, um, so the skewed societal norms of who belongs where has been a barrier and obstacle for both of you. And you found ways of overcoming that in different ways. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, do you feel, do you feel that the current and future prospects in this field have changed for people with characteristics or backgrounds similar to yours? I'll jump in there, Paxton. I, I would say yes. Um, for the most part, I think organizations have dismantled the structural barriers. I mean, there were times in my early career where I couldn't get assigned to certain locations because I was black, quite frankly. And uh, I objected to that. And I tried to push the boundaries with that. Eventually, they changed their policies, and they'll send anybody anywhere. Um, I think that prospects are generally better today, but it depends on two things. It depends on the organization. And more importantly, I think it depends on the leadership of that organization. Um, over, over the years, I noticed this in the Coast Guard, there's been sort of a sine wave of support for diversity and inclusion. It has ebbed and flowed. And I've tracked that to the interests and abilities of the leader, quite frankly. And so as this committee moves forward, that's something that you should take a deeper look at. How do you level out that sine wave so that progress is certain and true and sustained? Um, and more recently, I've got to say this, um, and I noticed this with Noah after I left, the actions of top leaders have been heavily influenced by the nation's social and political environment. And so how do you deal with those, those headwinds? Um, for, last thing I'll say is at the end of the day, leaders must care enough about the root of why some people in their organizations behave the way they do, or more specifically, they must figure out why a few people think that they can get away with behaving the way they do. Um, and that was my experience in the Coast Guard. Once the service decided to stop it, things got better for everybody. Thank you. Um, Paxton, do you have anything you wanna to add to that of how the prospects in the field have changed for people like you, like for women? Yeah, um, I have to say that women, I mean, working with Noah, it's majority women I, I've worked with and it's and it's been great. So I, I definitely feel like, um, you know, for me, I, I love seeing this amount of women working in STEM, working in science, working at NOAA, um, you know, and, and it's been great. And so I definitely feel like for me, the prospect of entering this career and continuing on with ocean studies, it's it's pretty high. Like I I um yeah, I I love seeing the amount of women that are working here and it just motivates me to continue working in this field. Um yeah, and I also feel like just here in Washington State, um, the amount of nonprofits that are wanting veterans to enter the environmental field is has been great too. Um, and and that's been uh, something that I feel like has changed for veterans um, entering this field. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, no. As a veteran and a woman in the sci um, ocean sciences, have you been able to, or I suspect you will, take the, the journey? Because you talked a lot about imposter syndrome, and that's so, it haunts us the rest of our careers, right? Um have you taken that yeah. and found ways to help others? And because there's going to be someone that you mentor at some point along your career that's struggling with the same thing. 
Yeah, yeah, I definitely, I mean, we've had other uh, Veteran Conservation Corps interns, um, women specific, uh, that have come along with me on this journey of the last year of this internship. And, and yeah, and I think just mentoring them, bringing them along with you uh, through it uh, has been, um, you know, a big, a big part of it. Uh, and and yeah, I am hoping to continue mentoring and bringing women into this field uh, and veterans into this field um, as my career grows. So sorry if that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so you both have seen the committee statement of task. Um, is there anything else that we should be considering um, as we move forward in this work? Yeah, Wendy, just a, just a few thoughts. I, I mentioned um, Kathy Sullivan's leadership when I was in NOAA to uh, undertake uh, an effort to enhance the climate and culture of, uh, of NOAA. I would take a look at that. Take a look at the mental model, the logic model that we developed that I think is still in use today about how to create transformational change within the organization. Um, the second thing I would suggest is take a look at what NASA is doing. Um, they have some relevance in the ocean space, I know, but um, they are the best in government with the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey. And they we know actually during my time there established them as the exemplar for what we want it to be like. Um, I mentioned FEVS. FEVS is the largest annual survey of government employees in the world. If you really drill down into that, there's a lot of rich data that may be useful to the uh, committee. And the question I have is, is there broader applicability for a database like, like FEVS or the process to create the database that FEVS has? And um, the last thing I'd suggest that the committee do is take a look at the work of Bowman and Deal. They have a book that we used in NOAA. It's called um, Reframing Organizations, Artistry, Choice, and Leadership. We found this book very useful to take this very complex subject and break it down into sort of consumable segments, if you will, because this is hard work and, and I applaud the work of this committee. Uh, this is a bit of a grand challenge for all organizations. And quite frankly, we've just scratched the surface of it. Thank you. Um, Paxton, how about you? Based, you, You've seen this statement of task for this committee. Is there anything else that we should be considering? Um, I I don't think I have anything to add for this one. Um, yeah, I I really think that increasing uh, veterans in the ocean studies, especially when it comes to Army and Marines, you know, things, these branches that really aren't water based, like they don't have a lot of water positions. You know, and I and I really feel like getting veterans when they're when they're coming out the door, when they're transitioning out of the active duty military and 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 becoming a veteran is is accessing them when they're transitioning and uh you know through the career skills program, just having more ocean study based internships and, and and things of that nature. I mean, especially because, like I said, I was based in Kansas, where there's no really water. Like I, um, you know, I I really feel like just getting them while they're coming out the door is is the way to just increase the diversity in this in this field um, with veterans. Um, and and yeah, that, that's really all I have to add. All right, thank you. Uh, Mansi, you gave us one resource. Are there any other resources or data that you are aware of or believe this committee should um, consider or review? No, not really. I, I took a look at all of the work we did at NOAA and really the 
Lee Bowman and Terrence Deal book was sort of our Bible as we have, as we work through this. I, I should add, with regards to NASA, we did sit down across the table from some of their executives and had had them share lessons learned from their journey. They've been they've been doing this a lot longer than most. And I think they continue to be best agency in government as a result of that journey. Thank you. Paxton, do you have anything you think we should be considering? I do not know. All right, thank you. Um, thank you both for joining us. Do you have any um, parting words you wanna share with us? Uh, if be, beyond this session, if there's anything I can do to help the committee, please feel free to reach out. All right, thank you. And the same goes for me. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you both for joining us. Um, we have um, some questions of Kiki. Yes, thank you, Manson and Paxson for joining. I have two questions actually. One is to dig deeper into something that both of you have touched upon. Um, and the other is one that we haven't discussed. One of the things that the study is wanting to do is to look at intersectionalities. And you both have mentioned physical location and access to other locations. Manson, you mentioned that there's a point in time um, in the Coast Guard where African-American people couldn't be assigned to certain places. Paxton, you mentioned being in Kansas and not having access to water. And knowing that a lot of the training for marine and ocean studies is happening on the coast, and knowing that active duty veterans don't have a lot of control of where they are, I'm curious if, um, sorry, active duty, active duty military, when um, active duty yeah. military become veterans, what is the mobility in in general? Are there continuing to be barriers because of other issues, socioeconomic, family constraints? Um, and so can we dig a little bit more into that landlocked physical location element that may or may not persist for veterans? And then also, can you tell us more about the supports that currently exist? I know, Paxton, you were benefited by this internship pro program, but how big is that? How many people come through that? Um, is it just for your branch of the military? Who has access to these things? So that's my first question. I'll follow up with a second later. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so, so the Army Career Skills Program it is just for Army, um, but it is military wide. It's not just for a certain base, and it and it really does depend on. Uh, the internships that are available in your area. So landlocked states, you're not going to get any ocean study type internship either. And I would say, you know, based off of my experience, I see a lot of veterans, especially younger veterans that just do one term going back home and working back home. And a majority of veterans that I know live in the Midwest and a lot of people that are pulled into the military come out of the Midwest, um, except, you know, like the larger states like Los Angeles, but most coast areas, I feel like don't get as much uh, active duty military coming in. So, so then you have veterans that are leaving the service that are going back to their Midwest state where there's not a lot of ocean study type work happening and so I feel like there's just that disconnect and honestly if I wouldn't have had the experience that I had through the career skills program and working on prairies and working with the base fish and wildlife I would have probably gone back to the midwest and and not done an ocean studies type work um you know it just kind of led to this to me getting into fisheries um but but it was because of these internships that kind of helped build my career up uh to get to this point but but i would say majority of what i find is that a lot of people will either stay like i am a transplant in washington i'm originally from ohio um that's where my family's still at but i have stayed in washington because of the environmental science work and the amount of work 
uh, that is here. And I know that this is where the most money can be made and the most career opportunities I have are here in Washington. So I've decided to stay. And, and um, I know that it also depends on how expensive the state you're based at is in. Like if I wasn't making disability, I probably wouldn't have afforded to stay in Washington state. I would have had to go back to Ohio or to a place that is cost of living is not as high as here. So a lot of people that are stationed here are leaving immediately after, you know, ETSing. They're, they're going back home to wherever that may be. But um, that's what I've noticed. Um, and yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, from my perspective, good to see you again, Kiki. Um, from, from my perspective, um, Paxton has hit on a lot of the key drivers. Uh, cost of living is a big one. Um, state entitlements for veterans and retired military is a big one. Um, the other big one is follow on professional opportunities. And I think that creates some space for the ocean community to woo veterans towards places where they have to serve. Specific to the Coast Guard, um, people generally retire in places that they've enjoyed serving in. You see a lot of Coast Guard veterans in New England. You see them all up and down the coast, down to Florida, down in the Gulf. Um, on the West Coast, predominantly in Washington and Oregon, they avoid California because of cost of living. Um, so that may also create opportunities for you. Most of the Coast Guard people I know that either retired or leave the services of veteran go on to work again. And I think they would be inspired by some of the opportunities the ocean community would uh, give to them. I personally have... Uh, helped a couple of my former shipmates, if you will, uh, land jobs in NOAA since I left. Thank you. And for my follow-up question, um, Paxton, you actually touched on this, is in my eyes, as I look at what makes ocean studies different in terms of barriers, one of the things that comes to the fore is the degree and amount of ableism. Um, and I'm aware that serving in the military People can come out as veterans having some disability, um, be it a physical disability, mental health. And have you seen or experienced this intersectionality of veteran and ableness, um, disability, been being an issue at all in terms of being able to access and become a part of and feel belonging and inclusion within the ocean studies community? I would say no. I, well, I I do feel like the, the field work that, that we do with NOAA is very, physically demanding um some of it uh especially when you're walking on creeks and rivers for miles uh you know i i am a disabled veteran and and so i have and i and i'm like i said this is st i'm still very fresh into ocean studies so so i'm i'm just an intern right now but i um haven't experienced any any kind of um like discrimination against being disabled like if i'm unable to do something then then like we'll figure it out from there it's it nobody has ever like targeted me for being disabled um and i've also worked with i mean through this veteran conservation corps intern we have put veterans into position with tribal uh, uh tribal positions working with um their fish and wildlife and natural resources and so i've met a ton of disabled veterans here in washington that are in fisheries working in ocean studies work um because of this internship because of this veteran conservation corps internship so there and i haven't really experienced any um any of them saying uh you know because i'm disabled i wasn't able to do this um even with it being physically demanding like i feel like 
the researchers and scientists that we work with are very accommodating to that and they understand that. Um, and, and yeah, I haven't really experienced anything else other than that. Yeah, from my perspective, I too am disabled. Um, and I'll just speak to it from a Coast Guard perspective. My sense is for many years, the Coast Guard has been very encouraging and supportive of disabled, the disabled community. Uh, my favorite engineering mentor was a triple amputee from Vietnam. He was the brightest engineer I've ever known. Um, when I uh, got sick many years ago, I was still serving in the Coast Guard. And I was surprised at how accommodating the Coast Guard was for me, even though I didn't fit the category of the Coast Guard medical manual. So I think through the wars we've gone through, through the growth of mil the military disabled community, perhaps as a nation, we've gotten much better at it. Now, the second part of this equation is the mindset of a disabled veteran. Sometimes we tend to be self-limiting. Uh, for instance, uh, when I left NOAA, I decided I couldn't work anymore. Uh, and so I limit myself mostly to mental work these days, and that's all pro bono. Um, we've got to find a way to reach out to folks like that and inspire them to sort of step up to the plate because Critical thinking is a is a necessary skill in the workforce, and there are a lot of great critical thinking um, veterans out there in the disabled community. Thank you, uh, George. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you both for your service. Um, greatly appreciate it. I had a question that. Uh, goes back a little while in your past, and that is that has to do with K through 12 education. Um, and Paxton, especially you mentioned uh, limited exposure to ocean sciences and, and ocean community. And I'd like to think over the last 20 years we've gotten better, but I don't know. So I'm gonna ask both of you how much exposure, how much information did you get about ocean sciences and the ocean when you were in school? Little to none. I, I mean, yeah. Um, even I live in, I, I grew up in Northern Ohio on, uh, right near Lake Erie. And I mean, still there was really, I, and I, and I really do feel like this, this hindered me in my, in my career, just like not having any environmental science, ocean studies, any kind of education, uh, you know, really through, um, kindergarten to uh, to senior in high school and you know and even with through my bachelor's like my bachelor's was all online and I feel like that definitely hindered me and I and I as an active duty soldier I I felt like the only option I had was an online school because I couldn't really attend especially I was working shift work as a correctional officer so I wasn't able to just go and attend classes, night classes. So it had to have been all online. And because it was all online, it was a very, very general environmental science degree, like very minimal lab experience and of no field work. So when I came into my master's degree, I felt like completely new to the whole entire field because I felt like I didn't get any kind of education in this and you know with it being Washington State focused I felt like I didn't have anything so so yeah no I didn't receive it like really any kind of outdoor education when I was younger uh, other than like some off the wall summer camp that the community college was throwing year but and that was like working in a creek and yeah that was it you know I so I never really got anything like that growing up yeah George great great question I was fortunate my father worked three jobs to send my three sisters and I to private school um I think through elementary school very little exposure to uh ocean sciences I went to a parochial school um uh, one of the things that I remember from 
the early childhood experiences is a show called The Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau. I was mesmerized by that show. And so when I went to a private high school, a lot of my projects were focused on marine science. Uh, you know, pollution was starting to rise as a big problem during that time. I wrote papers on it. I did models. I did all sorts of things. So when I went to the academy, my hope was to become a marine scientist, but they only had nine slots in my class and I scored number 10. So that's how I became a civil engineer. Now, the good news, I talked earlier about serving in the Coast Guard. Most of my career was really as an ocean scientist, if you will, working maritime safety, security, and stewardship. So I got fulfilled in a roundabout way. Great. Thank you both very much for your answers. I appreciate it. Yep, thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, Corey. Wait, you have a question. So we used to, I, I formerly was at Cal State Monterey Bay, uh, and you, we actually ran a, a research experience for undergraduate program. Uh, if you're familiar with that campus, it actually used to be Fort Ord way back when. And so there was still some of the infrastructure left when I was there. Uh, one of those being we still had a VA on campus. And that was actually a selling point for a lot of our applicants who were veterans. The idea that, you know, when they would apply that they, we it was unusual in that we actually had that as a support mechanism for veterans. And so they're actually able to, because they were still utilizing services. And so they knew there wouldn't be any discontinuation of services over the summer. And I was curious, you know, how broad that that is in the sense that having these other type of support mechanisms built in, right, if you're going to sort of host veterans in this case, like how broad that that seems to cut in some case, because again, it was just unique to our campus just because of what it used to be a, an actual military base with the VA and so we were able to offer that. And it's and we just we seem successful in getting veterans into our program. And in part, it seemed just because of that, in part, you know, there was a support structure. But I don't know how broad that is across the larger, larger veteran community in terms of thinking about additional support structure that you would need to facilitate these types of, you know, off, you know, these out-of-state research experiences. Yeah, I can speak to that, Corey. Um, I know that VA has a lot of programs focused on reemployment, if you will, but from a veteran perspective, we spend so much energy dealing with health care, dealing with disability pay issues. I'm not, I'm not sure there's the interest or capacity to really take full advantage of those other programs. Now, I know that VA is trying to do better and they've made leaps and bounds in, in recent years, but that is something that maybe you can talk to them about. So I think um, you know, I, I did decide to go cause I'm pursuing my master's right now at Evergreen State College and they have a big veteran community and, uh, you know, they were located about 20 minutes from the base and about 20 minutes from a VA hospital. And, uh, they have a big veteran resource group there, uh, that supports veterans. And I mean, just the amount of knowledge that the like resource coordinators have was a huge selling point for me to go to Evergreen because I mean it was very veteran focused they had a big veteran community and that was a big point for me you know I had the choice between like University of Washington and and here at, at Evergreen and and I decided to do Evergreen because of their veteran community so I think it does have a big uh it, it weighs pretty big especially when a lot of younger veterans or, or active duty soldiers are leaving the military after doing three, four years, um, most likely their plan is to go to college. And uh, and I I mean, God, I say like 80% of the people that I, that I started the military with that left after their first contract decided to go to college afterwards. And um, I don't know if that played, uh, if choosing their college, uh, based on veteran resources as was a factor but um i know that that's like a big chunk of veterans are are going um 
into college and right after service. So, so yeah, maybe that does play a, play a big part in what they choose. All right. Thank you. Uh, Kiki. So digging into the point that Corey raised and knock on effects, um, Paxton and, and Manson, you both mentioned the importance and power of cohorts of veterans and the understanding that that creates. You both mentioned that you don't that you felt like things were very open despite disabilities for possibilities within the military. Um, do you think there is a difference in communities in terms of opportunities outside the, the military in communities that have a wealth of veterans, veteran facing organizations and support organizations and thus familiarity in a non-military surrounding community of the capabilities of veterans as opposed to the experiences that veterans might have in communities that don't have that critical mass and understanding? Um, if that is true or not true, and if so, what can be done to spread the understanding so it is evenly distributed in all the places where people might want to get, receive, and work in the Marine training for or work in the uh, Ocean Studies community? Yeah, Kiki, the straight answer is I don't know. My entire experience has been with the federal government and the military. Um, and so I won't even speculate about about that. I, I, I will say that my general sense is that the federal government, because of its policies and practices, uh, is very supportive of the disabled community. Uh, I just don't know on the on the business side of it. Yeah, I, I would agree with Manson on, on that. Um, I, I might not understand the question correctly, but, um, but I definitely think that veterans are, are attracted to a community, um, because they were in a big community, uh, you know, big army community. And, um, so I do feel like, uh, you know, the, the federal government does attract a lot of veterans because of their policies and standards and whatnot. And um, so, so yeah, I, I, I can't really speak much on this either. <laughs> All right, thank you both. Um, any more questions or comments? All right. Well, thank you both so much for taking time to speak with us, um, share your story and give us some insights and for being open to having us reach out to you again. And thank you for your service. We really appreciate you. Uh, George. Sorry, you... I, was clapping. I hit the raise hand button by mistake. Oh, okay. He was clapping. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm gonna um, hand it over to Kiki now to um, introduce our speakers for accessibility and inclusion. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, all. Thank you, all. Um, thank you for the last panel. That was really uh, very informative. Um, our next panel, as Wendy said, is Accessibility and Inclusion in Ocean Studies. And we have Amy Bauer, who is a member of the Ocean Studies Board. And um, sorry, I have to switch between screens here. Oh, Riley Boyt. Uh, at Oregon State University. So if we could just start with a round of, of introductions. Um, Amy, if you could tell us a, a, about your background and, um, and your connection with this panel and any intersecting identities that you uh, are willing to share. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I'm at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, where I'm a senior scientist in the physical oceanography department. I've been at Woods Hole for a scary number of years, something like 36 almost, um, and uh, also recently completed a four-year term as department chair. Um, I... <clears throat> 
uh, I had a physics undergraduate degree and then discovered physical oceanography while I was an undergraduate through the Sea Education Association and then went on to grad school at University of Rhode Island where I got my PhD in oceanography. And then I came to Hui as a postdoc and I've been here ever since. Um, uh, and uh, well, while I was in grad school, uh, I was diagnosed with a degenerative retinal disease um, when I was about 23 years old or so. And uh, that was going to sh assuredly lead to a decline, an uncorrectable decline in vision slowly over time. And that is what happened. Uh, over the last 30 plus years, I've lost almost all my useful vision. Uh, so I'm almost totally blind at this point. And um, and I, I'm uh, I identify as female as well, and so there's some intersectionality there. Thank you so much, Amy and Riley. If you could introduce yourself as well. Yeah, I saw the name Amy Bauer come up, and I was like, "What a legend!" This is the name that keeps coming <laughs> up for me. So we will. Have oh my to goodness! <laughs> Hi, I'm Riley Boy. Um, I am a master's, first year's master's student. Uh, Oregon State University under the Chapel Big Fish Lab studying salmon sharks. I went to um, the University of California, San Diego at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which is a big mouthful for just a really pretty campus. Um, I did marine bio and ecology there. Um, and the reason I'm here is I am the founder and CEO of Disabilities Within Ocean Sciences. Um, so focusing a network and organization for disabled marine sciences of all career stages and paths. Um, and giving them the resources and guides needed to kind of excel in a very um, exclusive <laughs> field. And then I am disabled and queer. So I have dwarfism, chronic pain, ADHD, a myriad of other things, and then also queer and identified as female. Thank you so much to you both. Um, if you were on our last panel, the questions are the same, but I will pose them to you um, for your unique, res unique responses. Um, first, have you experienced any challenges, barriers, or supports in pursuit of your career? And if so, if you could tell us about them. Okay, yeah, I'm happy to start, Riley, if you like. Um... I did this in kind of a bulleted list a little bit. So if it comes across that way and not as eloquently as the last panelists, I apologize. Um, but I wrote down as my first major challenge was just being a member of a super minority. Uh, people with disabilities are underrepresented in STEM, uh, ex you know, uh, to an extreme level, even more so than women or um, people of uh, various racial and ethnic backgrounds. Um, so just being an only one. When I was diagnosed in graduate school, I didn't know a single other person who was blind, much less any blind scientists. So I had a lot of doubt at that time uh, that this was even possible. And I had an ophthalmologist who didn't help the matter either and said, oh, you're studying to be an oceanographer, you know, you should change to science administration or something like that, you know. I, he, without even asking me any questions about the type of ocean science as I was, I think he was imagining microscopes or something, um, which I don't use at all. Uh, anyway, I, I was very enraged uh, by that. Um, hurt first or, or disappointed and then enraged and determined to prove that ophthalmologist was wrong. Uh, so, um, so that was, the, you know, those were early challenges uh, for sure, um, which led to self-doubt, imposter syndrome, one of their last panelists mentioned, um, you know, and those were all challenges that I had to overcome to, to, to more or less uh, some extent. Um, if I get into some of the more pragmatic barriers and challenges, uh, the inaccessibility of electronic documents is a big one. Uh, you know, the, everything you can imagine that we work with digital documents now, you know, from on the internet, uh, PDF files, everything we do, right, email, um, it's much better than it was, uh, but it continues to be a major challenge um, for blind and low vision people. Um, I ha I do go to see, I have gone to see, I don't go as frequently as I used to. Um, the inaccessibility of lab equipment on research vessels uh, is another barrier. 
uh, and makes me hesitate to go even because if I can't access the equipment on board, you know, kind of what's the point. In 2008, UNALS um, released a report, uh, recommendations and guidelines for ship operators on uh, accommodations for persons with disabilities um, that, you know, that's pretty long time ago. <laughs> uh, I have talked to UNAL's office about possible updates. I haven't gotten into it with them. I just, because of bandwidth issues, um, but on my part, um, but you know, that probably needs to be revisited. Um, um, I'd say, you know, getting back to being a super minority, you know, just being, having very little community. Uh, especially in the first half of my career, I would say it's improving now, but um, was and and no mentors to speak of, you know, at all, uh, no role models. Um, so I, I can also go on things that have been supportive, though. Um, I've had the full support of my employer, Woodsole Oceanographic Institution, in terms of accommodations. And that was through the ombudsperson first, uh, that I went to first, because I was afraid to go to HR to ask for accommodations. Uh, then later, HR EEO department was very supportive. And more recently, we now have a DEI officer who's also very supportive. Um, and that support of the employer with accommodations has been huge. And I think Woods Hole Oceanographic has been a st exemplar in that regard. Um, I hear horror stories from other institutions, not just in ocean science, but in STEM in general, you know, of students or early career researchers who really have to struggle to get uh, universities to um, pay attention to their accommodation needs. Um, and, and the kinds of support I've received is software, um, like screen readers, which is what a computer reads out loud, uh, everything I read and write, uh, hardware like scanners, you know, Woods Hole paid for all that. Um, they extended, I requested and they extended my tenure clock because everything, especially at the beginning, took me longer. Uh, reading, you know, just straight, straight reading took longer. Um, they provided salary for extra administrative uh, support and uh, an assistant to go to conferences. Uh, and that has now, all that kind of support has converged into a new position here. Uh, and I just hired my first one called an access assistant. And um, I, I refer to it as my, um, uh, my wheelchair ramp <laughs> in a way, right? I mean, I, uh, it is just certain aspects of this career that are not accessible, no matter what, in terms of technology. And I just need, someone with uh, normal vision to get the job done. And um, so the institution is paying partial support for an access assistant. And the last thing I wanted to mention that's helpful that may not be on your radar is uh, NSF has facilitation awards for scientists and engineers with disabilities. Uh, that's uh, where one can apply for a supplement to an existing grant to facilitate work by persons with disabilities on a specific project. F-A-S-E-D. So I'll stop there. I was nodding along to a lot of that, Amy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I feel, thank you. I feel that very deeply, especially with one poll. I know um, uh, Elizabeth Siebert just built her like accessible dream lab and I kept hearing about it and I got to consult on what, if I could have a lab, what it would look like. So I, I can definitely see how wood toll is above and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, I think I might have the horror story then. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you you went in to say um, that certain aspects of this field are inaccessible. And I think it's a majority of the <laughs> aspects of this field are inaccessible. But in terms of challenges and barriers I've experienced, um, it's been a lot of both. I We actually are looking into building a research vessel that's accessible. It is a very messy process, but we're hoping it works out, I keep hearing from folks that are like, oh, the really big ones are accessible, but not ADA accessible. I was like, if you're not hitting the bare minimum of ADA accessibility, you're probably not hitting accessibility at all. Like, let's just be clear there. But um, aside from that, I had very similar experience um, to Amy. Uh, it wasn't a doctor, but it was a lot of folks growing up. I think I was one of the kids that 
saw Shark Week and other things and was like, ah, yes, this is what I will do with my life. And so many folks were like, hmm, can you? Like, that's, that's a lot. Like, can you handle this? And it kept being that thing. So for a really long time, I thought it was only going to be lab work. That was, that was all I could do. It was going to be microscopes, which I rarely encounter microscopes in my day-to-day -day now. Um, but it was, it was a lot of that and a lot of physical barriers, a lot of putting myself in dangerous situations to access lab spaces or both. So I would be on like rolly chairs because I'd show up after having requested accommodations and those accommodations would rarely be met or I'd be using tools that should not have been used the way they were being used to reach things, to access things. So I've encountered very physical barriers um, often, especially especially on boats where uh, I got blessed purely by coincidence um, working in the Bahamas where we have really low rigs. So I was able to access the sharks. And then I moved into the bigger boats and someone would be holding my legs as I'm dangling off the side of the boat, like working on a shark, which if anyone here is uh knows osha that didn't happen um but it, it, was, a, it was a lot of <laughs> a lot of things like like that like putting myself in these situations that aren't great and i i'm so very lucky to be at the big fish lab where the accommodation has been a big forefront into what we're doing um what we're trying to do with the building this boat with creating a lab space um it's been kind of a dream uh, I've never had this experience. I'm still waiting for the other shoe to drop, but it's been a year, so I'm suspecting that it might not. Um, but I think a lot of it is not even the physical access barriers of like conference research and academia, but it is a lot of the big societal, like the field itself. Um, Amy mentioned that there are very few disabled people in marine science, and it's actually 75% less disabled folks in STEM than in any other industry which is um, from the Atkins and the Barkin paper from 2016, I'm pretty sure. So I'm not sure how much those numbers have changed, but I suspect for the field-based science that number is even lower. Um, when I am encountering disabled folks, they're rarely uh, physically disabled. It's a lot of um, invisible disabilities or neurodivergence, which is still far and few between in our field. So I think it's a lot more of not being taken seriously, not being given accommodations, um, struggling to get collaborators. Because when I show up, they're like, oh, four two, shark science, these don't go together. So I think it's, it's a lot of that. And in doing the work that I've done, just talking to everyone um, who is in the field and is disabled, it's, it's kind of the same, same concerns and barriers that are being reiterated. Is that like, if they can get into the room, then the room is not accessible. And then some people can't even make it into the room. Um, so I think it there's there's a ton of barriers. But in terms of support, um, Big Fish Lab has been amazing, and I have been very lucky with um, collaborators like Miss um, and other um, disability stuff like Accessibility Sharks of creating those kind of support networks. But it's definitely been slower going than I would uh, would like. So. Thank you both um, for those really candid responses. The next question actually digs a little bit deeper into these same things. And I think the heart of this is getting to the narratives that really flesh out the details. Uh, well, that's one of the things that we're, we're interested in as a committee. Um, so this question is, have there been any specific experiences that you believe have either helped you overcome these challenges or hindered to advance, um, hindered your advancement. So if there is any of one of the things you listed or something you didn't mention that you wanna dig in more and, and tell us more of the narrative that goes with it so we can really try to understand that experience, that'd be great. Hmm. Yeah, I guess for specifics, just elaborating slightly on this ex access assistant accommodation. Um, that was actually a, a concept that I learned from, uh, there's an assistant professor of uh, bioengineering at Northeastern named Mona Minkara. She's not an ocean scientist, but, uh, and uh, so she's at the beginning of her career, whereas I'm more at the tail end. Um, and she, as part of her negotiation for her um, faculty position, she requested that Northeastern support two or three access assistants. I think one is administrative, one is for teaching, which I don't do uh, much of, so, and one is for research. 
Um, and when I heard about that, I was like, yes, yes, <laughs> that is an awesome way to uh, package the accommodation, I think, and to, and um, that, that, and now I, here I am, I'm 64 years old, okay, and I just got my first access assistant. Now, that doesn't mean I hadn't had access assistance in the past. I have, but it was people who had other jobs to do, like, um, I have another research associate, you know, whose job is to do the research with me, you know, uh, in our group, like the real, the actual research, not to work on accommodations. But now I have somebody whose half-time job is to make sure I have access to the material I need. And I'm just like, oh, I wish I could start my career over again with that, you know, because it's been so much struggle just to get to the starting line. Um, what Riley said about getting in the room, like if you can't get in the room, you're out. For me, if I have to spend so much time just getting access to the documents, just getting to the starting line, you know, that's how I, I describe it to people. I spend much more time just getting there, much less dig into the substance of the discussion, whatever it is. Um, so um, th this access assistant uh, concept now, I'm, I'm super huge on that. Uh, it's been very uh, mind blowing to me now. Uh, um, so that that's one example. Uh, I'll pass to Riley. Um, in terms of access assistance, they have been like rumored fable that I've heard. So to hear so many folks are getting this, I'm like, oh my gosh, I need an access assistant. This sounds incredible. And what you said really um, kind of things for me I guess with the um there's so many folks in my life who are support networks that are not access assistants that are like it is not their role to be doing access and they've kind of helped with that and they've needed to do that because I, I don't have an access assistant um and I again reiterate just how lucky I am with my lab but there's so many times where it's like okay, we're taking away from valuable time. We could be doing literally anything else to be building out this or to be trying to make this more accommodating or trying to get me to the starting line for very basic tasks and stuff. Um, and it it ends up being exhausting. It like it gets very, very tiring, not just not even just doing it yourself, but like involving other people whose role is not to do that it can be a very exhausting um, process because then you're dependent on someone in a way that like it's not their job, if that makes sense. So the idea of having an access assistant is dream that I, you know, when I when I get to a position that I can start asking for certain things and have the money to ask for certain things, that will those will definitely be up there. But um, experiences that have really helped me overcome these challenges, I got a bit lucky by pure coincidence coincidence in the beginning of my career in an unrelated to marine bio way in that my first job was working at the National Wildlife Research Center um, with John Eisman and he kind of watched me struggle for those first few months and was like yeah this isn't going to work like you're not being led into the lab you're not being like this is, this just doesn't fly you're not going to get the experience you need and there was a lot of big door openings that happened through that of I was just getting tossed on every single project and kind of a both of us proving I could do it moment that really, really helped, I think, um, cement that one, I can do it and cement to others that it was possible. Um, and that kind of uh, passion, I guess, or that, that um, trajectory kept me going through scripts, through um, the Bimini Biological, uh, Bimini Shark Lab, um, doing stuff like that just kind of not racing to the not racing to the starting line, but kind of a marathon to the starting line of realizing like there is support and there are folks that can you know help you. And if I keep showing up and I keep making really loud noises, eventually change is going to happen. Um, but it is those those tiny access needs that can really kind of whittle down um, the will to get to the starting line, which I realize is a bit bit of a tangent, but I think. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, hindrances that I could name and it would become a long bulleted list, but I'd like to, the support is the bigger part. And I think it does come from those folks that it's not their role, but they they are helping in that. 
if I could just amplify what Riley said about um, uh, requesting accommodations, um, there's a huge, my, just from my own experience, especially for the first half of my career, huge hesitancy to ask for accommodations um, because of stigma, right? And, uh, you know, had a deathly fear that someone was going to turn around any minute and say, what? You can't do this. What are you talking about? That's ridiculous. You know, and oh, I was so scared that somebody was going to turn or come around the corner any minute and say that. In fact, it's actually not happened to me. I am grateful uh, that my community has not. People have made some stupid insensitive comments once in a while, but nobody has sincerely said to me like, oh, I don't think you can do this. I heard there was a little discussion about it when uh, I was being considered for department chair. Oh, can she do it? You know, or whatever. But uh, they never came to me and said, do you think you can do it? You know, <laughs> so, uh, um, but, but this hesitancy to ask for accommodations, and I wrote about this in an article in Oceanography Magazine a little bit, just a slight bit more elaboration about what I think employers need to do to break that barrier down uh, more and make it more open and welcoming for, and I call it go beyond compliance, you know, and really welcome persons with disabilities into their workspaces. Uh, and I know that many employers have fear that accommodations are going to cost them an enormous amount of money, but that's actually statistically not the case. And there, the Department of Labor has some statistics about that. Most accommodations don't cost that much money, uh, but employers have a misperception that it will. And so they don't even want to, oh, stick their neck out, you know, and 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 offer them openly. They just sit there, oh, behold, nobody asks, you know, because, oh, it's going to get so expensive. <laughs> but it's, you know, on the other hand, it's the law. You know, um, but so th so there's this difficult dance going on here. Uh, the the employees are hesitant to ask because of stigma and fear of being turned down. Employers are hesitant to offer openly because they're misperceptions about cost. Um, and so one thing that I wish I had learned earlier was to be a more open and a direct self advocate. Uh, it's hard, though. It's hard. Okay. To kind of um, keep jumping off of this point we're making, I yeah no self advocacy is incredibly difficult, and I um, talk to a lot of folks that are new in a disabled journey, similar to like what Amy had, you know, becoming um, newly uh, having vision issues and being you know that that fear because I think there is a difference in transition um, when you're asking for accommodations with if you been born with a disability versus if you're newly disabled because there are all the stigmatisms yes. and kind of that um, internal ableism that you really have to unpack. But to reiterate Amy's point and just to put a number to it, it's at most an accommodation is cost an employer $500. And that's like right off the yes. bat, there's not going to be a lot of financial obligation. And there are so many, so many grants that will cover those that it is not worthwhile and I think that stigma really like you said it's kind of a feedback loop of it makes employees or students afraid to discuss accommodations and it makes employers afraid to offer those accommodations um, and I I have had the experience um, at UCSD especially of being denied accommodations over and over and over again oh really being told that I'm I was so not able sorry to. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, I left out with OSU, and so it was really interesting at OSU when I asked for my accommodations. I was like, all right, bare minimum. I'm just shooting for what I need to, like, be in a literally physically safe. Like, what do I need here? And then we got done, and she's like, I feel like maybe you're holding back. And I was like, all right, well, I rarely hold back, but what do you mean? She was like, it seems like there's, like, a lot more accommodations that you need. We can, we can meet those accommodation needs. And I was like, this is you're lying to me like this is actually a joke like it was so unbelievable to me after hearing so many folk experiences in my own experience that when I got the list of all my accommodations and they were all checked off I was like this is okay and like then the next quarter it rolled over and it was still a thing and it's been a thing now for a year and I'm like all right all right maybe maybe I am getting what I need um but it is that that those barriers and that those conversations that 
happened to a lot of folks that it's incredibly lucky that you haven't had that, Amy. That's I know, I know, I, I understand. Yeah. My experience is not typical in that regard. Yeah, yeah. Um, which which is awesome. <laughs> I'm glad I know, I know, but I, I know, I hear you though. I hear you. Um, yeah, but I think it, it is a lot of those conversations, and there's there's been conversations when I've been on a boat. Um, I was denied going on a research cruise. The captain had never met me, but I was a safety issue. And there wasn't a discussion of accommodations. And when I posed the accommodations that can make it a safe space, it wasn't a discussion. I was a risk, I was a liability, and I didn't get to go on this six month research cruise. That one would have been just incredibly cool, aside from the marine bio, like academic, but it would have really furthered my career um, in an amazing way. And I, I was denied that. And then luckily, Silver lining, COVID happens, the cruise got canceled. So <laughs> I feel a little bit good about that. <laughs> um, but bummer that the science didn't get to happen for a few months. Um, but I think mm. there, there are, it, it is that big hesitancy. And the big thing, and I've read that article you wrote, Amy, it's incredible. Um, I think the big thing is employers like setting it as a standard that accommodation and access to the thing, that access exists and it needs to be universal access and then creating a point where employees, collaborators and other um, management can come and be like, hey, I need accommodations. And it is fast, quick and seamless. It's not this big ask, it's just a standard mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, and I know we're saying employees, employees, but that's the same for academic settings. It's the same for research yeah. labs that needs to be the same yeah, kind students, of across. postdocs, yeah. Everything. Yeah, across the oceanic field is that it is just a standard of practice that accommodations are given. I really appreciate the wealth of the dialogue and the dialogue between the two of you. <laughs> Things that I'm holding in my head as a result of this, um, I particularly like the framing of the hesitancy to ask for accommodations is not an issue with the person, it is a barrier within the institution. It's a construct and people are sensing that and aware of it. I, I really love that. Mm -hmm. Particularly like how you enumerated and fleshed out the cost of getting to the starting line, which I think is really um, important. And then there's, there's something that you said to Riley that is both a win, but also a cost. This, the moments of proving you can do it and the sea change that happens to it to around you when you do that. Um, but I can also see that there's the cost for you to do that. But I also can see that that's laying foundations for the people who are coming behind you. Um, so, so much richness in that conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, there's a couple other questions. So, uh, and I think we're just kind of moving into these things. Do you feel that the current and future prospects in this field has changed? for people who um, have similar disabilities to yours. And I would tack into that if you want to add into it, intersectionalities as well. You want to take this one, Riley, to start? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll start with the disabled and intersect part because I know that's what we're talking about the most. Um, but I, I do definitely have more hope. Um, than I think I did early in my career. My career has not been that long, so it's nice to see that change is occurring, but it, it is very slow going. Um, I've been in disability advocacy pretty much my whole life, but seriously for the last 10 years. Um, and there there is a change that I think in these DEI discussions, especially in marine science, disabled folks are being left out time and time again. So it is those kind of small uh, niche organizations, schools or movements that are coming, but I'm definitely encountering more and more the more I talk about it, the more um, conversations like this happen. I'm encountering more folks coming up to me and being like, I actually have a disability. I'm like, yes, yay, welcome, thank you. This is so <laughs> good, we need more of you. Um, so I think uh, role, like programs like the Accessibility Sharks program, which is incredible, um, it is a paid internship for disabled um, undergrads to get actual lab shark experience, which is very hard to get. Um, and they have all their accommodations needs um, met, which is incredible. It is really small right now. I think they're only taking three or four interns this year, but it's bigger than it was last year. It's hopefully gonna grow next year. So it is, it is things like that, that we're, we're seeing kind of that, that um, growth. So the, the future of the field, I think, is looking very promising. I, I am hesitant, which is a word that keeps coming up for us, but 
um, it's, it's starting to look a lot better than it did. Yeah, no, I have a similar outlook. Um, I'm optimistic from the blind and low vision perspective. Um, the technology is advancing uh, rapid, has advanced over the 30 years I've been here uh, um, tremendously such that uh, the screen reader in particular, which is the software that where their computer speaks out loud um, is you know, means that a blind or low vision person can use a computer in many sophist very sophisticated ways completely independently, you know, so that, and I, when I advise students who are blind or low vision, I say, you got to master your computer skills. That's your window to the world, you know, in STEM or, and in life. Uh, so, um, because the screen reader is so powerful of a tool and, you know, that's really matured um over the last 30 years so i'm optimistic about that you know braille literacy is pretty low still um especially with all these talking products now um and you know a lot of students just decide not to learn braille and you know the accessibility of braille textbooks is difficult and uh so um but but the um text to speech uh developments have been huge and now with ai even I'm thinking ahead that the um, AI describing graphics, because graphics is still a real stumbling block for blind and low vision folks, um, as you can imagine, it's a visual thing, right? So, uh, um, but you know, AI has the potential to describe graphics pretty accurately in the future, not now, but in the future. So the, I'm optimistic about that too, as a, in STEM, throughout STEM, you know, not just uh, marine science. Um, although I still think, I'm sorry, go ahead, Riley. No, 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 you're good, please, please continue. Okay, I just was one more thing I was gonna say, I think we still have a long way to go in educating, and this would go across the disability community, I think, educating parents and teachers of young students. Um, if the parents and teachers are not, uh, aware of the opportunities and the possibilities, uh, their students are gonna have a hard time finding those opportunities because parents and teachers have so much influence on young students and, and what they think they can do you know, in the future. Uh, if the parents or teachers are in any way discouraging, you know, that's gonna have a huge negative influence. And so parent, you know, that's a group that needs to be brought along about the future possibilities. I keep just nodding along. I feel like my neck is going to hurt by the time we're, we're done with this. I'm, I'm like over here like, yes, that, that's uh -huh. a great point. Um, so I see a hand raised, so I'll, I'll let that happen and then say my other point. Um, well, we have a couple more questions and then we'll, we will get to uh, questions from the group. Okay. Yeah, then I, then I'll add on to a little bit of what we talked about because I definitely forgot my I did, I did disability generally, I think, for the future prospects, because I don't know that there are a lot of dwarfs in um, STEM. I don't, there's not a lot of us, I shouldn't say I don't know that there is not a lot of us in STEM, and there's especially not a lot of us in marine bio. I haven't encountered another dwarf yet in marine bio. Um, we are, and this can be a pun, we are a small community, um, and so there is typical crossover of knowing folks, but there, there's not a lot of dwarfs in my um, cohort in terms of marine bio. I'm the only one. Um, so my I'm kind of trying to create as much representation that I can for those young kids, those teachers and those parents that Amy made a point about so that in the next generation, we will see um, folks like me in marine bio. And then in terms of intersectional identities, uh, there, it's a very beautiful crossover of queer folks in marine bio. Um, and we are seeing a lot of big changes around that. There's a ton of just incredible organizations doing really good work. But I think the disability, um, queer intersectionality is a very unique one. Um, and there isn't as much work being done right now around that. So I, I do have hope, but um, it's a little bit uh, less less strong than the hope I have for just the disabled folks in this field. Thank you for sharing that. 
The next question is, based on the committee's statement of task, which uh, hopefully was provided to you, is there anything else that we should be considering that we haven't touched on so far with the questions we've asked you? I just had one thing, um, and and I I may be getting a little nitpicky on the wording of the statement of the task, but um, and I don't I'm sorry I don't have it right in front of me, but there's a phrase. This is, we're going to focus on basically diversity, equity, inclusion. Da, 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 uh, especially for racial and ethnic minorities or underrepresented groups. And I and then there's more wording about intersectionality, you know, across veteran status, uh, disability status and everything. And I guess it's my narrow view, you know, my personal experience. I wish disability status was up there with racial and ethnic uh, uh, focus, um, you know, not just in its ex intersectionality place, but in its own place, um, because the the underrepresentation in marine in science STEM in general by persons with disabilities is very severe, um, and so I feel like it deserves to be uh, considered uh, as an underrepresented group of its own. I, does, does that make sense? I hope. <sighs> Uh, just so you know, there's a lot of yes, yeah, agreed that was in the room, but not being picked up because the mics weren't on. Okay, okay, great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's all I had on the statement of work. Yeah, I think all, all the notes I had, we have talked about in some, some kind of um, route or another. I think to kind of reiterate, having um, disabled be up there is disability is the most diverse group because anyone can become disabled at any point in their That's life. A really good point. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and, and a lot of people will become disabled at some point in their life um, as they get older and the current healthcare system. So I think there, there is uh, just, just ensuring that disability is one of the big forefronts and it's not seen as intersectional and as, as kind of like a group that does have intersectionality um, in terms of everything else, the statement of task is absolutely incredible. It um, was really, really well done. Um, I feel like I've seen a few statements of task and I'm like, oh, okay, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna be redoing some stuff. But I think, I think this was just really all encompassing. That's good to hear that. Um, I agree. Really positively, I, I think. Um, one way that we can try to begin to address some of the concerns of, about the placement of disability and how it's considered in this, this statement of task, we aren't going to be able to change it, but we can address it more the more resources and data that we have. I know that both of you have written on these topics and are engaged around it. So the last question is about resources and data. The more the committee has around this more we can include in the study. So the question is, are there any resources or data that you're aware of um, and you, that you believe that the committee should be considering or reviewing? Yeah, I, I wrote down a, oh, go, go ahead, Riley, you wanna start? No, no, you're, you're, you're good, go for it. Okay, okay. Um, couple of things here. Uh, I leaned on the NCSES, uh, which I think is the National Census of Scientists and Engineering Statistics or something like that. Um, that's where I get my numbers on representation for women, uh, underrepresented minorities, and persons with disabilities, NCSES. Another one, I um, Daryl can give you uh, uh, my PowerPoint slides probably from, I was sat on the UN Decade uh, committee on an inclusive and equitable ocean. It was a workshop uh, in March, I believe, and I presented there and I presented some of those NCSES statistics there as a starting point. Um, the other, um, the um, Disrupting Ableism webinar series uh, that the National Academies sponsored about a year ago in June, um, there were like seven sessions over a month. Uh, everything is recorded. And on June 10, coming up, 
is going to be a, sort of a recap, a reflection, actions taken, um, a, you know, webinar online uh, the, the, at the National Academies. Um, so, and then um, that article that I led in Oceanography Magazine at the end has, a li uh, I'm sure, not a complete list of resources, but a partial list of other resources, um, like the Do It uh, group at University of Washington and some other links. So that's it for me. I, you took a few of mine. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's great crossover. Um, I, I also have um, a link, I think it's in my email, that links to a, just a huge bunch of resource guides. The issue is there isn't a lot of um, research that's been done around this. There's definitely needs to be more. Um, one that I always recommend to folks is Uncharted, um, which is a collection, I think it's like 50 marine scientists with disabilities um, that are going to have more, kind of give you a broader spectrum of disability than just Amy and I will. Mm -hmm. I think that is an excellent, mm -hmm. um, massive source. And then uh, um, the geoscience, oh, what is it? IAGD. Oh, ID, is, yeah. There we go. Yeah, there, I was like, I always the inter, forget there. Uh, uh, <laughs> international uh, for uh, geoscience diversity. Geo. International yeah. Association for Geoscience Diversity. IAGD. Yeah, they yeah, switched it. Yeah, I A G D. Yeah, that's a good they one. They are, they are incredible. Um, they're doing they're kind of leagues ahead in a lot of um inclusivity. They've done a bunch of stuff around um trans and non-binary in the field. They've done some stuff around disabled folks in the field, and really have created kind of a nice resource in terms of just inclusion in general in ocean sciences that I I heavily recommend. Um. And everything else is just blank to my mind. But yes, I have I have a, a, a articles as well that are out, and then also that link that um, can be followed that has more information. Thank you, Amy and Riley. Riley, just one quick follow up. You mentioned Uncharted. You said it was fifteen individuals with different disabilities. Are, are those like narratives or biographies? Could you tell me just a little bit more about what what that is? They are. Um, interviews so narratives that have been uh, interviews that have been turned into a narrative by um two disabled marine scientists oh that's, that's a book uh, it's a published book now right? yeah sorry published Riley. book yeah yeah oh awesome yeah. That's wonderful okay yeah. it um came out last year actually mm -hmm. wonderful thank you for sharing that because we are actively collecting narratives um for this oh, that would be a good one How about that those are all of our formal questions, and now we can open it up to the group. Um, I see Wendy has her hand, and followed by Erin. Well, we'll start with Wendy. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for sharing. It's really been um, impactful and um, foundational, uh, changing my foundational concept of this, because as a woman in ocean science, a native woman in ocean science, I already have two strikes against me. Mm -hmm. And so I have a hidden um, disability, but I never acknowledge it. I just work through it the best I can. So thank you for normalizing that. Um, and and um, I think that's something we have to do is start normalizing. We're diverse and we have different needs and um, we don't fit into the mold of white male. and um, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, do you have any um, advice or suggestions for normalizing inclusive practices in a classroom so that students aren't othered? And I'll, an example is I have, um, I teach a grad program and I have a student who's visually impaired. And so rather than giving her a week to take the exam, I give the whole class that time. So it's mm -hmm. a normalized practice so that she doesn't feel othered mm -hmm. and doesn't and, and to foster that sense of belonging for her. So, so that everybody mm -hmm. has that, um, uh, I, I guess it's a option. The same experience, basically. The same experience. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do you have any other um, recommendations for things that can be done to normalize these practices because they're important for that sense of belonging? Mm -hmm. I 
I think it is that like that is creating universal accessibility because she's probably not the only one benefiting from that in that week. There are probably um, students that have hidden disabilities, that have neurodivergence, that have other intersecting identities, that have different um, home situations that are going to be really benefiting from you know that time. So it is creating those universal accessibility practices um, in your teaching as someone currently in the middle of grad school, I think that is, it is the flexibility that really can make access and accommodation and then ensuring that your classroom has access and accommodation and not, I think, assuming that the school will handle it. So doing those, those basic universal practices in, in teaching is really, really important. And then I can let Amy, because I think I might have interrupted you. I apologize. Yeah, no, no, yeah, I agree with everything you said. And I, I don't teach in the classroom right now, so I don't have as much firsthand experience to share. But I do want to amplify again what Riley said about um, finding those accommodations in the classroom and not counting on the disability office necessarily to provide them. Uh, there are some HIPAA issues and things, and I know because I have a student, I have a daughter uh, with a disability too. And the, the, I understand the rules that it's up to the student to approach the professor uh, once, once their accommodations have been recognized by the school. Uh, it's up to the student to approach the professor to request uh, accommodations. Um, and so the professor can't go around asking everybody, do you need one? Do you need an accommodation? Right? That's not allowed. Um, but um, normalizing it, yeah, I, I think the more you can do, you know, you can always offer to a, an entire classroom, say, if anyone uh, is would like to discuss accommodations, let me know, you know, that's uh, another way to welcome uh, and let, let it be known that you are open to the discussion. Um, but I thought your idea of giving everyone the same amount of time for the exam is a good one. So thank you for that. The next question is from Aaron Borey, who's also a committee member. Um, I'm thinking about probably four different ways to ask this question. So I'm sorry for how, um, how I'm going to fumble it, but um, I appreciate that Wendy went first because uh, she mentioned unacknowledged disability. So I, um, I was born hard of hearing and uh, just sort of muddled my way through life. And then COVID happened and everybody wore masks and I realized how bad it was. And so it was only then that I had to really sort of acknowledge what that meant for me because of the ableist society we live in. And um, so thinking about that invisible disabilities, normalizing and things, I I'm sort of wondering, so we can have organizations that, and people in those organizations that are really supportive, but I'm curious if in ocean studies with a community I'm not part of, um, what is your experience with microaggressions or even macroaggressions about your disability? And like, aside from the support that you are able to receive. Uh. Sometimes I think I'm a, somewhat oblivious to it. Uh, there may be some or the whispered conversations or whatever that I haven't been aware of. And then there have been some people have made some stupid jokes and things like that. Uh, and but small number, you know, I've been very fortunate. Um, I uh, I do think sometimes I am left out of certain discussions. I have wondered over the years whether people are afraid to drop into my office and talk science, maybe about a topic that maybe is not my topic specifically because it almost always involves a graphic. Of, Here, let me show you this new plot. I just did it. Well, Amy can't see that. So I guess I won't talk to her about that. You know, I do worry about that, but nobody articulates that to me. You know, they don't say, well, I was gonna come by, but I decided not to because you can't see my graphic, you know. Uh, so I think it's subtle, uh, but I think I have been excluded uh, in these subtle ways. But I, you know, I just to overcome that, I just keep doing my thing, you know, and reaching out to people I want to talk. I yeah no micro macro. I don't know if you noticed my smile. It wasn't one of like 
joy. Um, <laughs> I think I think there are quite a few, and that left out of discussion thing, I I know happens for sure. Mm-hmm. There's been quite a few times it's been like alluded to or been like, oh, we chatted about this. Um, I know when we were talking about um, getting an accessible boat, I uh, have two, there's two advisors in our lab and it really was a conversation where someone was like, yeah, have you ever seen anyone like Riley? And they were like, no, I've never seen anyone like Riley in this field. And it was like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I think it, it is those kind of conversations also of, you know, like the dropping by or, um, uh, I think I've definitely been left out of field work. I've been left out of a lot of opportunities and I wasn't privy to those conversations that happened um, until maybe after or assumption based that they like, okay, not 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 being taken on this um, this research cruise and not being taken out in the field a few times is starting to feel less like my science is being questioned and more like my abilities are being questioned. Um, and so I think I think those conversations happen. And then yeah, there's always there's always the microaggressions I think that come along with um, most marginalized identities. Um, so, you know, the, the ill time jokes and everything. I think everyone uh, here, or at least most folks know um, the death by a thousand cuts that microaggressions can be. So I think we, we will always, always kind of have um, those experiences, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, so uh, we're getting, we have some more time, but we definitely have some great questions in the queue here, including one that's mm-hmm. in which I'll read later, but we'll next go to uh, George Matsumoto, who is another committee member. Thank you very much. There. Thank you very much. Uh, George Matsumoto, I use he, him pronouns, Japanese American male with gray hair, wearing a Hawaiian shirt and sitting at a table with 10 other people. <laughs> Thank That's you. Fine. Um, I had a question that is actually very similar to Karen Romano Young's online. And this has to deal with the idea that you are the one, as you mentioned during your overview, the role model, the only one like you in the field. And my question was, do you feel put upon or burdened by the by the perceived need to help others? And Karen Romano Young phrased it much better, and she says, do you feel unfairly burdened with the need to advocate for and represent people with disabilities in the field? And if so, or even if not, how can storytellers and science communicators working to help diversify the next generation of ocean science best behave in order to respect and not add to that burden while providing support and mirrors to current students? That is a fantastic question. I'm gonna mm-hmm. let you take it first because I think yeah. our answers might be slightly different. <laughs> uh-huh. Um, I guess my answer is yes and no. Uh, Yes, I do a lot of that work. Do I feel it's a burden? Yes and no. Uh, I know that I do it and my colleagues don't do it. They don't need to. They're not in my identity, so they wouldn't do it Uh, anyway. um, But I have a very strong feeling of obligation to do it, though, because I remember so vividly my own experience emerging into the disability community and seeing nobody there and the and the fear that that brought on and the uncertainty in my future. I'm just determined for other young early career researchers in my in those shoes, you know, to not experience the same thing. Uh, so. Um, Yes, it, and I, I'm again maybe who I'm a little bit fortunate here. It, I probably was more worried about it, and it did feel more like a burden when I was pre tenure. But after I got tenure, and as I've gotten now more senior, even more and more senior, I I've decided that I can almost have more impact on marine science now doing this kind of work than writing yet another journal of physical oceanography paper. Um, and so and in my, you know, we're evaluated every year. I don't have any more promotions to go through. So I'm in a very comfortable position to do this. And the institution here does recognize the value of it. Uh, they, I'm not penalized for it, really. So it's a conscious choice for me at this point um, to spend a fair fraction of my time uh, doing this uh, to try to ease the way for the next generation. 
but it um, but it could be it, yeah i'll just say but that is from the perspective of someone who has tenure and is very senior okay and i totally recognize that for early career researchers to could totally different perspective could be um i think typically yes i don't know that i'm the one that's going to have that answer i think a lot of early career um disabled scientists are, are going to feel burdened. They're going to feel um, yes. exhausted. And it's very scary to do that. I am lucky in a way in that I've been disabled my entire life, but I don't know that I've ever felt that burden. And I might just be spicy enough that that burden's never been a thing for me because I think I have been very vocal um, and it's been a huge part. And I was very lucky to be raised around disabled elders. So I don't, I don't think burden is the word I would ever use. Um, I think I have the very unique position of being able to use my voice and being able to um, talk about this kind of um, hard to discuss topic. Um, so it's, it's never nev never been a burden, um, but it is definitely the fear. I don't have tenure. <laughs> I don't, I've, there are many, many, hopefully many, many raises in my future. So I think there is um, the fear of being penalized. So I think it's, the bigger fear that no one's going to be talking about this and nothing is going to be done kind of eclipses um, the mm. fear of penalization or the fear of consequences. Because the bigger consequence is there will be no one like me after this. There will be no one like Amy. There will um, be less and less uh, disabled folks in the field if we don't speak up. So it's not a burden. Um, it's not necessarily a privilege, but it's definitely definitely the fear that things don't get better makes it a whole lot easier to speak up, I think. Um, and then I think Karen had a second, George and Karen had a second part, their question, if someone could remind me what that was. <laughs> yeah, it's mostly with how can science communicators help uh, convey the message that you're trying to get across to future students? And can, can it be done, how best to do it respectfully without imposing more commitments and mm -hmm. so responsibility or obligations on the tool. Yeah, I I think we have all heard about allyship. <laughs> I think we've all heard about how to be a good ally. Um, the discussion surrounding that and it really goes to allyship. It goes like Amy said. You know, she's the only one talking about it. If it's not her, like her colleagues aren't going to be. Often people don't talk about. Um, marginalized communities unless they're part of said marginalized community. And I think mm -hmm. it is that amplification of voice, amplifying the voices that are being said and amplifying um, injustices when you see injustice. So it is, it is, I think, a big part of being scientific and being storytellers, which love that word, Karen, um, is making, is, is allyship, is we should not always be the ones that are bringing mm -hmm. it up. So mm -hmm. in, in meetings like this, in settings like this, in academic conference, you could be in the field and you notice something. It, it, is, your, it is your job, it's your duty as an ally to speak up in that moment. I think that mm -hmm. is the big, it is the unburdening of this, this kind of task that we set ourselves um, is to really make and ensure. And that goes back to um, Amy's point of teachers and parents of young disabled um, kids is that 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 is that con those conversations need to be happening um so that it is in a continuation because that, that is paving the way and creating a more accessible future that's not being paved along the backs of disabled folks so i think having having those big conversations and ensuring that it's not just us especially when we're often excluded from the room and then if we are in the room ensuring you know our voices are heard and then you're amplifying past that point is, is the big point thank you very much Thank you both for that question and answer. And, and Riley, there's something you said that really stuck with me. You said, I'm fortunate enough to have been disabled my entire life and to have um, disabled elders. And the the ease in which you said that and owned that in, you, in your identity was really refreshing and it was something that was sitting with was, as you were speaking. I also want to thank George for reminding us of best practices. And so I'll take this moment belatedly to say that I'm an African-American middle-aged woman with dreadlocks and glasses, currently mm -hmm. wearing a mask because I'm recovering from what I hope is just a cold. <laughs> we'll see, we have two hands up. We'll see if we can get through. We only have four minutes left, but I'll pitch it over to Nancy Knowlton, who's also on the committee. Hi, I'm a 75 year old 
woman uh, living in Maine, re uh, communicating remotely. Um, so I wanted actually the conversation dovetailed really nicely into the question I was going to raise, which had to do with this whole role of parents and uh, teachers, of, because I feel like that's so critical. Uh, in the United States, it seems to me like one of the big challenges uh, is the fact that educational systems are so, you know, broken up by school districts and states, and there's mm -hmm. no, you know, national entity. I I don't know anything about the resources that are available to parents and uh, teachers that would help address this problem, and whether there would be a way for, in particular, for marine science to be uh, featured in any kind of, you know, uh, resources that are available to encourage parents and teachers to encourage their students to think about all possible uh, pathways in life, including marine science. Do you have any suggestions of so, a way into that very disarticulated community, at least from the teachers? I don't know. Maybe the mm -hmm. parents are more, you know, organized. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a great question, and I don't have anywhere close to a full answer. I'll just add a couple of thoughts that the um, national presence that I'm aware of is tends to mainly be disability-specific. Uh, for example, there are several national uh, societies, associations for the blind. National Federation of the Blind is the largest one, and they have many resources for teachers and parents and families available. And in fact, they for several years, they've had a STEM focus uh, as well. Um, and other than that, um, across the board, uh, yeah, I, I think parents usually seek out disability specific information. Uh, it, it, I'm, we're, I'm trying with I have affiliation with Perkins School for the Blind. We, in fact, tomorrow we have a group of students coming here uh, to be introduced to marine science uh, with hands-on accessible activities. So we do it every year. Um, so, but it, the, you know, that's a very one-off thing. I, I also have a website. I'm trying, you know, trying to reach out and make the field visible. Uh, so pun pun not intended. <laughs> um, to uh, as many as possible who might not consider marine science as a pathway for them. But it's, uh, yeah, but Riley may have more resource ideas. That actually was exactly what I was going to say. So that works perfectly because I know we're getting very short on time, but it is very disability specific. Uh, there isn't really a national organization that I know of that's doing that type of work, especially around marine bio. It tends to be like, this is little people of America committee uh, or like organization and conference and that is the organization that parents and te teachers tend to go to so it, it typically is disability specific so I don't know that there is a national movement or a like entity that's doing that work the closest thing might be that I A D no G D <laughs> uh, yeah. I A G D <clears throat> because that is across uh, dis diversity uh, across disability really um so that, uh, and they do, most of the people on the list that I see are professors, actually undergraduate professors teaching yeah. geology, I think, and, and working on field work accessibility for mobility impaired mainly. Uh, that's been their yeah. focus that I can see. Yeah. So geology is kind of a decade ahead of the yeah, work. Yeah, I agree. Um, so yeah. We're, we're doing our best to catch up on the rest of the ocean sciences. So. Yep, yep. So we're at the hour, but we have we're gonna um, have take one more question uh, because Ken has patiently had his hand in the air. Uh, one of our committee members. Yeah, I'm just gonna take twenty seconds and say seventy two years old um, on virtually, and I think your presentation and your um, presence here really inspires me to ensure that we give voice in an effective way to what you shared about having your voices heard in our report. So I wanna thank you for um, being who you are and for sharing with us. Oh, thank you, that's good news. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Amy and Riley uh, for coming and speaking with us for 
um, all the information and resources you've shared, feel free to continue to send things our way. Um, and we'll take all of your comments and, and thoughts into account as we move forward with this study. And now I will pass the baton back to Wendy. Thank you, Kiki. Um, Thank you. So it's my pleasure to um, host our speakers for the Indigenous and Native Communities, um, Sarah Ahrens and Melissa or Misty Peacock. And I want to give you a moment, uh, Sarah, uh, to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Ahrens. Um, I'm a Nupak. I'm born and raised in um, Alaska, born in Dillingham, raised in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, and I'm an assistant professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, I, my research focus is primarily isotope geochemistry. So I've done a lot of work focusing on the mineral dust cycle, both in the modern and also in the paleoclimate record. And uh, we've recently, our lab group has recently started working on non-traditional stable isotopes um, in the ocean. So looking at seawater and marine sediments. So I'm um, happy to be here today. And thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's always good to see another Alaska Native woman. <laughs> um, and then I'll give Misty a peacock. Do you, would, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, hello. Uh, my name is Misty Peacock. I am non-Native. I'm a Caucasian uh, woman. And I am the director of the Sailor Sea Research Center at Northwest Indian College. I do want to take a moment and acknowledge the fact that I live and work in the traditional lands of the Lactamish people. Um, the Lactamish people are also known as the Coast Salish, um, and they have been living in uh, the western part of North America since time immemorial. Um, I'm at a tribal college and university, and there are 37 of them in the United States. It's a land-grant university. Um, we are the only university that has a standalone marine research center in that tribal college system. Um, and the work that we do is on food security and data sovereignty. Specifically, my background is in harmful algae and biotoxins in seafood. Um, and so uh, the work that we do is really um, focused on community input and touches a lot of um, things that are really important to the indigenous communities in Western Washington, including um, climate change, resources management, um, as well as uh, climate and environmental justice impacts. Um, thank you so much for inviting me here today. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you both for introducing yourselves. And I know you have been sent questions and we'll start off discussing, um, have you experienced any challenges, barriers or supports in your pursuit um, of this career? I see you both smiling. So I know there is some. <laughs> Sarah, do you wanna start? Sure, I can start. Um, yeah, so I, I think, um, yeah. Coming from Alaska, you know, Anchorage is a pretty, pretty large city, but yeah, going to undergrad out of state and like the culture shock that was associated with that um, was a challenge. And um, yeah, being away from like family support networks um, was a, a big change and a big difference. So I had a couple things happen um, like during grad school, um, including like having a parent diagnosed with a fatal disease. And um, at the time when I was in grad school, taking a leave of absence, like wasn't something that was very common or like looked upon in a positive way. So um, like, I think as an Alaska Native person, we have a really strong connection with our families and it's pretty much the most important thing to me personally. And so, yeah, the um, the pushback that I got from trying to prioritize family over, over the graduate school career was, um, was challenging. You know, when I, when I took the leave of absence, there was a lot of pushback from um, advisors at the time. And then I also had like a lot of grad students in my cohort, assuming that I wasn't planning on returning. Um, but I did end up returning. Um, yeah, so it's just, uh, I guess the main thing is just the path, you know, um, isn't always a direct, you know, arrow. We don't always know what's going to pop up or happen in our careers or in our lives. And 
um, understand, like having mentors and supervisors who understand that um, not everything is going to be like a simple, um, you know, A to B pathway and that it's okay to take, it's okay to, you know, mentor students who need to go home or take leaves of absence to reconnect with their community or do something that's important for their families. Um, I feel like since then, um, I don't know, my perception of uh, the way that academia views leaves of absence, it seems to have improved. So um, yeah, I'm happy <laughs> about that. Um, yeah, and then I think um, in terms of like my identity uh, as an Alaska Native person, I think a lot of people um, throughout my career have attributed my success or my position to like my identity. So I've heard several times from um, professors in grad school um, or even like people who are my colleagues, um, you know, oh yeah, well you got that award because you're native or oh yeah, it was, it's gonna be easier for you to get a faculty position because you're a woman and you're native. and you know, at the time when I first started hearing these types of comments, um, yeah, you internalize them and you're like, you, I mean, I would think to myself like, yeah, maybe it is easier for me. Um, and then it starts this whole process where you really start to question and doubt your, your presence in a place. Um, even getting hired here at Scripps, I could feel that there were like undertones of, um, oh, well, she got this job because she's a Native woman. And yeah, and I think I really started to reframe the way that um, I responded to those types of comments. I started to think about um, everyone else who's in a position and how they got there and whether or not they had, you know, barriers that they had to jump through or um, whether it was easier or harder for them to get their position based on their identity. So, yeah, I mean, I think probably, um, you know, those are challenges and it, it's like, you have, I think a lot of people struggle with imposter syndrome um, and it's probably something that I may or hopefully may not struggle with for the rest of my career. But yeah, I think that's definitely one of the biggest challenges. Um, yeah, for me. So I'll just, I'll stop there. And Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely difficult when your identity is weaponized against you. Um, Misty, would you like to speak about challenges, barriers, and supports in your career? Yeah, um, I took this question a little bit differently. I want to talk um, both about in my career working at a Native Institute, and um, but first I want to bring up working with the students at my institute and their uh, barriers. Um, we are a tribal college and university, and our students um, a lot of times are at tribal colleges and universities because they're safe places that are different than mainstream um, academia. A lot of our students are um, in a second career phase. They're coming into academia later in life. Um, they have different challenges than a lot of mainstream 18 to 21 year olds who would be an undergraduate um, student would be. A lot of them have family obligations. Um, I really appreciate how Sarah talked about um, taking care of a family member um, and having to take a leave of absence. Um, a lot of our students live in intergenerational families. Um, which is very common within Native communities, but may not be so common in mainstream academic communities. I know that there are other uh, people of color communities that often do that as well. Um, so it's not just a Native exper experience, but a lot of our students are also um, young parents or they have students and so they have family obligations. Another thing that often isn't seen in mainstream academia is that we are in a rural community and some of our students don't have access to computers. They don't have internet. They don't, we live in a food desert. They don't have access to um, sustainable food options, which can make it really hard to focus and go to school. Um, another thing I wanna talk about um, that happens with our students um, is something that has been referred to as a cultural tax, um, where our students are propositioned 
maybe every day with opportunities to go to this intern, to participate in this project, to do this, to do that, to do that. I recently had um, another academic from a mainstream institution reach out to me and say, which one of your students can translate my abstract that they didn't work on into um, solution, uh, which was just a generalized one of the 23 Coast Salish languages. Um, things like that, where, where the students are kind of asked to um, not only do the regular academics, but also present themselves as a native person in academia, doing all the right things that native people do, as well as being an academic. Um, so that can be really difficult. Another thing is 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 honestly the lack of um, native people in ocean sciences um, and being able to uh, go on to graduate school with somebody who has had their same experience as they have and who look like them. Um, I can't stress enough how powerful it is to have um, to be able to learn science from somebody who has had a very similar experience as you or who looks like you. Um, and so having those peer mentors or having a cohort of students or having um, faculty advisors who have had that same experience is really important, I think. Um, just in terms of challenges and barriers uh, that happen, um, Sarah talked about the kind of, I call it academic side eye. Um, so our uh, institution, my department is 100% grant funded, and I can't tell you how many times um, in mainstream granting cycles, if I receive a grant and somebody at a mainstream oceanography school does not receive that grant, the kind of academic side I was, well, because she's at a native college or university, um, you know, or like, oh, she comes from such a good background, I wonder why she's working at a tribal college and university. Why is she not at Scripps? Why is she not at Huey? Why is she not at University of Washington? Um, things that happen like that, it can be really hard to internalize them as like a professional in the field. Um, and so you got to see that that can be magnified um, upon our students as well um, and young Native scientists. And I want to just bring up one narrative. So we hired a postdoc in 20. Um, 20 during COVID. Um, and we were going through the NSF stats on uh, the um, that they release every year on who um, has received their degrees in ocean or geosciences um, each year. And she looked back at the stats from 2016 and says, look, I am the only Native American who completed their oceanography PhD at an academia and university. And so you can see how rare it can be sometimes and how that can be really isolating. Thanks. Thank you. I uh, appreciate you um, talking about the, it's uh, what the, the burden that is given to students and um, to provide their cultural expertise. And the it, it brings uh, that imposter syndrome of I'm here for my scholarship and you're tapping into me for my cultural identity, which can be damaging to students. Um, so have there been any specific experiences that you believe have either helped you overcome these challenges or your students' challenges um, or have hindered your advancement? I guess I'll go first again. Uh, yeah, so I'm everything I'm going to bring up is mostly like personal to me. So <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, I think when I was going through all those challenges in grad school, um, yeah, you question whether, you know, you have what it takes in order to like finish the PhD or you have the ability to continue in academia um, because yeah, it's like I'm prioritizing family over my career at this point. And so is this gonna, you know, is this like the kiss of death for the future? You know, people always say like, oh, don't do that because it'll like uh, disqualify you from academic jobs in the future. So um, I think when things really started to change for me was when I um, met the, the first like Native American geoscientist besides myself with, you know, who was a, uh, an assistant professor, um, Kathleen Johnson at UC Irvine. So she was like the first other 
native geoscientists that I met. And um, yeah, it was through this summer program that she had started, funded by NSF, um, the American Indian Summer Institute in Earth System Science. And um, basically, yeah, so meeting her and like our instant connection and our ability to, um, yeah, I just felt like I knew her already and everything that I shared with her, she understood because she had a lot of similar experiences. Um, and like mentoring students who came from um, reservations or like really small communities in Alaska and um, and like through conversations with them, you know, finding out that we all had like shared common values and like not feeling like I was such an outsider or like alone um, in the field was like really valuable for me. And then like after that, I became more plugged in with the ACES community and like meeting people, not necessarily like in geoscience, but in biology and chemistry um, who, yeah, it's like, you don't even, it's like you instant trust, none of the ability to like share things with people who are also in academia, but there's not a judgment that is passed when you share personal information or a weakness or, you know, a struggle that you're experiencing, just being able to be around um, other people who I felt like understood me on a level that I wouldn't necessarily share with um, like my grad student cohort members. Um, so yeah, I think finding um, native communities in, um, in academia, in geoscience, I think was like the point where things started to change a lot for me. I started to see how well, if she could do that, if she became an assistant professor and you know had a similar background and experience that I did, then I think I could probably do it. And so um, it kind of gave me, I feel like it gave me the strength to keep pushing and trying and like applying for things. Um, yeah, so, um, and then like the sense of, um, I don't want to say gratification, but just, yeah, like the feeling that I got from mentoring other Native students, um, it took away from all the negative things that can pop up in academia, like I brought up earlier, like the academic, I really like that term academic side, I have never heard it before, but I'm going to start using it now. Um, it, it makes all that stuff um, I guess worth it. Uh, yeah. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Misty. Yeah. Um, I can't stress enough, um, not as a native person, but as a female in science, how important it was to have female mentors in my life who helped me with my career, who had experiences as me. Um, I was a mother when I was a graduate student. So being able to work with mothers like that. And I can imagine as a minority, it must be even more difficult for our students to feel that way. Um, so I talked about um, the availability, avail availability of grant funding. Um, and so really funding um, and kind of this push for more indigenous science um, in the ocean sciences, in climate science, in environmental justice has um, provided funding availability so that we have actually built um, a really strong uh, undergraduate research um, education program. And one of the things that we do is we hire graduate student and faculty mentors who are indigenous and working in the sciences. And so we can um, then afford to pay for them to come and work with our students. As I mentioned before, a lot of our students don't have that opportunity to fly across the country or to another institution to do a summer um, intern experience because they have uh, family or intergenerational um, uh, things that they need to do. They need they need to be at home with their family. And a lot of times they need to be place-based doing research. And so just having um, somebody who can talk about their experience, like Sarah said, meeting that mentor, whether it's a graduate student who is also indigenous or faculty members who are also indigenous in the sciences can really be powerful to say, you're not the first, you can also do this, you can move ahead. Um, there are people who are paving the way for you to get into this field and um, there's space for you. 
they're, they're, um, these people who have gone before our students have made space in this field for indigenous students to be in the ocean sciences. Another thing I think that's really um, been uh, helpful is the fact that um, 98% of our students here at Northwest Indian College are indigenous, um, but we don't just serve Coast Salish um, people. We have more than 130 federal um, tribes, Alaska natives, or uh, our close, uh, the close cousins across the, um, the country from Canada um, represented at Northwest Indian College. And so there's a lot of our students who have never experienced oceanography or been on the water. They come from Navajo country, they come from um, the uh, Midwestern states of America or Canada, or they come from inland Alaska. And so having them be able to take this opportunity to experience um, place-based ocean or climate research is, is really important. And I think when you think about like major academia, if you had an oceanographer um, who was from Kansas, you'd be like, oh, what got you interested in the ocean? Um, but I think that's a lot harder for indigenous people who uh, may not have the resources to be interested in the ocean because it isn't part of their culture originally. So I think that's really been beneficial. Thank you. I like that you both brought up um, environment from two different perspectives. One is moving out of a, tr a traditional community, a village or a reservation. Those are very different lives for us. And then moving into an academic space, that environment itself, more people, people you don't know, um, the culture is different, creates a stressor for students. And so um that makes it a little bit more difficult to stay within that discipline. And then Misty, you talked about how you guys have created at Northwest Indian College, uh, a safe space for students to explore um, these different sciences still grounded in their cultural identity. So thank you both for that. Um, you both have um, seen our statement of task. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead too far. Um, do you feel that the current or future prospects in this field have changed for indigenous people? I can go first, Sarah, <laughs> this time. Um, I wanna say yes. So I have been here for seven years. Um, when I first started, um, it was kind of a smaller undergraduate cohort. In seven years, we've had uh, 72 internships for Native students. And um, of those 72, um, almost 30% uh, of them have gone on into the field of environmental science. Um, and I think one of the things that has changed over that last seven years is really a lot of um, of the federal granting agencies and a lot of the federal agencies putting specifically into their priorities um, statements of inclusivity, um, diversity, climate justice, environmental justice, and specifically calling out native um, communities as wanting to increase that. I think that there's also been, um, at least in Western Washington where I am, this movement towards um, the workforce um, in ocean sciences being science itself. So this inclusivity of people who are fishermen, people who are traditional um, clam clamors or um, who work on the ocean, who look at shorelines, who work even in um, farming and are caretakers of the land as being ocean scientists. Um, and I really appreciate that there's kind of that broadening of um, what an ocean scientist is. Thank you. Sarah, same question. Do you feel that the current field or the future prospects for this field have changed for indigenous people? Yeah, I mean, I think I would just add on to that, um, that when I, yeah, when I was in high school, I was never exposed to oceanography or earth science or geology or anything like that. So the first time I ever took a class on any of that was, I think, my junior year of college. So I switched majors really late, um, and I didn't even know that it would it was a possibility to study this until pretty late, you know, um, eventually. But I think, you know, now 
there seems to be a lot more um, summer programs for um, middle school, high school, um, and like RU programs for, for students to gain research experience or just um, awareness of the types of um, science that people are doing in, in the ocean. And um, so I think just having that knowledge of, of what is possible and what's out there um, is really powerful. Um, like I brought up the, the ACES like summer program that was um, led through Kathleen Johnson's work at UC Irvine. And, uh, you know, I think there's like I, between five and 10 students who participated in that program who ended up majoring in environmental or earth science, which to me is, you know, a really big deal because, you know, like we, you brought up the number of uh, PhDs in ocean science or geoscience in 2016, and it was super low. Um, yeah, one for ocean science, and I think maybe one or two for geosciences, and I think I was one of them. So, yeah, I mean, I think having um, more of these um, experiences and and funding through, you know, um, agencies like NSF funding opportunities has been really powerful. Um, I there's there's already programs that exist, like in Alaska, for example, Alaska Native Science and Engineering Program, um, which is basically um, designed to increase the number of Alaska Native um, engineers and scientists. Um, and you know, it's like a mentorship program that starts in um, middle school and it goes all the way through a PhD program. So I've been really um, like encouraging colleagues to to get involved in, in presenting their research to ANSEP summer school students, because that way you're not really reinventing the wheel. You're not starting from ground zero and trying to reach out to communities and, and um, um, rather you're really just like plugging into a program that is already um, well-oiled and, and is working really well to mentor native students. Um, yeah, and then I would say that in terms of, um, you know, getting into undergrad or graduate school. One thing that I've noticed over the past like five years since I've been at Scripps is um, people have started to look at applicants' um, files differently. So um, I think, you know, previously people were really focused on GPA um, and test scores. And now I think people are realizing that there's a lot more to um, a person or an individual than grades and um, and their ability to perform well on a test. So looking at a person more like holistically and um, finding out more about their experiences, their life experiences, things that, um, challenges that they've been through. And I think people are starting to realize that GPA and test scores are not going to, they don't necessarily dictate how well a person is gonna do in a PhD program or what type of scientists they're gonna be. It's actually like the resiliency that they have, their ability to bounce back from um, personal challenges or professional challenges um, and to keep pushing through, um, yeah, those experiences is what, what really matters. And it's been really nice, I think, for me to see that happening because I think we're ultimately gonna end up with a more diverse group of scientists when we look at, um, applications that way. Thank you for that. Yeah, um, building on that a little bit, 40% uh, of Alaska Natives are dyslexic. So asking them to perform on a written test like that um, is just automatically gonna, they're gonna have lower scores. So finding alternate ways to um, bring people into programs and support them is really important. Thank you for talking about that. Um, so now to the statement of task, based on the committee statement of task, uh, is there anything else that we should consider? Hey, Wendy, um, I'll go first again. I, uh, so I've been involved um, in quite a few of these kind of um, statement of tasks, like what can you add anything to this? What do you think of this? Um, and one of the things, I think it's great. I think that um, the governments and academia are going in the right direction um, in increasing inclusivity and being part of this. Um, I do wanna point out that a lot of times there's still that cultural task 
where they will say, okay, well, we're going to hire an indigenous person so that they can help us design this. We're going to um, ask the indigenous community to help us do this. Um, and um, working in indigenous communities is not always a straight pathway. Um, there's a lot of uh, speed is built or, or trust is built at like, um, you know, sorry, I, I've forgotten the the um, statement, but essentially a lot of times communities need to be able to trust the people that they're working with. And a lot of times academia or federal governments um, want to go at a speed that is not approachable or appropriate to that nation. Um, also, I mentioned like here at Northwest Indian College is we have 130 different nations um, that are represented. And um, so it's not just the one size shoe fits all. Um, and so it can, I can see it from both sides where it can be really kind of this disjointed gain in terms of including diversity and equity um, within uh, people and just understanding that it's not going to be like a one and done. It's going to be um, a living document that will continue to need to change and be worked on. Thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate Missy's comments about the need for time for building trusting relationships um, <clears throat> and relationships that are equal. Um, and I think I'll just add to that and saying that anytime, um, you know, colleagues approach me about working with indigenous communities in the Arctic um, on science related topics, um, specifically like climate change related work, um, I always kind of ask them first off, you know, what do you know about um, Yupik people, or what do you know about Inupiaq people, um, like the history, or um, yeah, the history of colonialism there. And um, a lot of times um, people are like not aware of any of that. And so um, I think one of the most important things is knowing some information about communities or people um, before you um, try to actively engage with them because um, knowing some information about, um, yeah, things that communities have experienced. Um, I'm gonna just like focus on, on Alaska, for example. So um, things like, you know, uh, forced removal from, from villages um, uh, and, you know, generations of people being sent to boarding schools, for example. Um, there's a, a history of, um, uh, like trauma that exists there. And so there tends to be in a lot of communities, a mistrust of people who are affiliated with the government or in academia. And, um, you know, I, I bring these up to like my colleagues just because um, I just think it's, you know, you shouldn't, I feel like no one should ever approach uh, a situation where they're not really sure what they're um, stepping into. And so um, and it's not necessarily like um, that person's responsibility to inform everyone about like uh, everything that that community has experienced or, or seen or gone through. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't want to say that there needs to be some history um, lessons here, but I, you know, and obviously like each um, native group or nation has a very unique um, and nuanced history that is can't be covered in like one lesson, but I think there needs to be some thought put into um, thinking about, yeah, history and culture um, before, you know, pushing for um, these, um, these goals for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that helps with um, meaning making as well, right? As you're getting information from community to interpret it the way that they have intended it to be rather than through your own lens is so important. And I think what you're talking about is lifelong learning. It's not a one and done. It's a continual learning process, especially from nations and individuals within those nations who are just now able to learn who we are, that we haven't grown up knowing 
and we're just now learning. So how can other people know who we are when we're just learning? So thank you for sharing that. Wendy, um, can I just add one more quick thing? Absolutely. Um, so this first statement of tasks, the collection of existing narratives, um, specifically to help clarify the variety of barriers that exist and the losses caused by these barriers, I think that it's important to be careful with that um, based on what Sarah has said as well. A lot of times when you ask students, students get asked those questions all the time, you know, what did you need to help make you do better? But a lot of times they don't know because they haven't experienced that. And so if you ask them, what was a barrier that kept you from doing X, Y, and Z, it can be really, um, it, it's not accusatory, but it can almost feel that way to our students. It can cause a lot of distress in the way that that they're ashamed that they weren't exposed to some of the things that their peers were or other students in academia. Um, and so it kind of comes off as a negative, like, you haven't succeeded, what was it that kept you from succeeding? Rather than like, what could we provide that would help you succeed more? Um, which sounds really silly and kind of nuanced, but I think that that happens a lot. People are like, well, what are the barriers that kept you out of science? And they're like, well, but I'm in, I'm in science. I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm here. See me. <laughs> so um, just sometimes it can be a little bit um, disconcerting for our students. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, are there any resources or data that you are aware of or believe that the committee should consider or review during this study? Um, one thing that I think uh, review committees such as this might miss is the fact, at least in Western Washington, which is where my experience is, that a lot of the different communities have their own kind of climate resiliency, ocean sciences, environmental justice plans. Um, a lot of them are public, but again, there's no one repository. You can't go on the NASA website and get Lummi Nation's climate resilience plan. Um, but you can go to the Lummi Nation website and that plan is available that talks about the important factors. Um, it includes environmental justice and how their student pathways, um, et cetera. And so I think that sometimes because it's not all in one place, um, because indigenous people are not one group of people, they're sovereign nations, that um, a lot of that information is available and can be missed. And so I would really um, suggest that some effort be spent in finding it on communities or reaching out to communities and asking. Thank you, that's a great point. Thank you so much. Uh, Sarah, Are there yeah. is there any data or resources that we should be considering? Yeah, I mean, I, I brought up um, ANSEP and also um, ACES, it's um, a AI, AISIESS, -E and because it was funded through NSF, you know, they, I think, yeah, every year there was like a pre-screening um, questionnaire that students filled out before the camp started. It was a two-week residential summer program, um, and then after the two weeks, they would fill it out again, and so we were able to see, like, how their perceptions about what they knew about the earth as a system changed um, throughout the course of the two week program. And then there were follow up questionnaires. So tracking the students, I guess, attrition, you know, through time. Um, so there are, and I don't know, you know, if that data is, is, I, I, yeah, you'd have to ask Kathleen Johnson about that, about the availability of that data. And then also, you know, I know that, um, programs like ANSEP, you know, they keep really close track of like, what happens with the students? Where where do they end up? Um, their job placement? Do they end up working in industry or do they go into academia? Um, and so, and ANSEP is a program that's been going on for a pretty long time. So yeah, yeah, like what Missy said, it it, it it's probably going to be pretty challenging because like I'm only really familiar with like Alaska based stuff, um, and then also like you know ACEs because I was involved in that. But I'm sure that there are many others out there. Um, that have been tracking this sort of thing. So those are just like um, 
yeah, two things that I wanted to bring up. Great, thank you. Um, so we'll open it up for questions now. Any questions or comments? Uh, Paul, go ahead. So thanks for um, your comments. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, sort of the speed of that science moves is sort of um, at odds with the need to, you know, really develop these relationships and partnerships that are necessary to be uh, working uh, with uh, indigenous communities. And it seems like since we're being asked for things, um, for suggestions on, on how to dismantle barriers, it seems like maybe one thing that might be worth proposing is that, you know, NSF does set aside some money that, you know, can fund um, the development of these relationships so that, you know, we don't have people who have a three-year grant that are just trying to like, you know, go in quickly, get the work done and, you know, ignore the relationship building that's, that's, nece that's necessary to be successful and, it seems like they do provide funds for other sorts of working groups and you know meetings and whatnot. And so it seems like this is something that that we could propose. Do you think that that would be useful? I, I'm in favor of, yeah, that suggestion. I mean, I, I think like I'm most familiar with the Navigating the New Arctic program through NSF just because, yeah, I had a lot of colleagues here at Scripps talk to me about it, about, you know, asking me to put them in touch with communities. And um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the nature of the way that like science, academic science works and um, indigenous science and what um, indigenous communities care about, they're, they're different. So like here at this academic institution, when my file is reviewed, they're, you know, counting papers and grants and, um, you know, they look at the other stuff that I'm doing, but like, I would say by far, you know, papers and grants are more heavily weighted. Whereas like, um, so yeah, a publication all wrapped up in a tidy bow, whereas like um, an indigenous community, like if you're doing a project there, you know, they're not necessarily going to care about whether you publish a paper in nature climate change or anything you know they're they're going to care more about like real tangible um outcomes from a project so yeah i mean i think i've thought a lot about this it's like how do you um how do you put like two disparate groups together that have really different goals um and outcomes that they want um and merge them into something that you know, they're working together. Um, and I, I think it's, it's just something that, yeah, you have to be really intentional about. You have to take a lot of time um, to build trust and have, you know, conversations where people are putting out on the table, like, this is what I want to get out of this project. And then, you know, someone else is saying, well, this is what we want to get out of this project. And I'm um, talking about like data sovereignty, you know, what will happen with data, um, and, and including, you know, for example, like if you're working with um, an indigenous community with like students, for example, if you're collecting data, like what's going to happen with that data, the questionnaires that the students are filling out. Um, yeah, it's all important stuff that has to get figured out beforehand. And I know that um, people had complained to the Navigating the New Arctic program about the stress that had been put on communities you know, people were like uh, native communities were inundated with requests to collaborate. And they, you know, at, at here at Scripps, I get this nine month salary, but you know, like um, an indigenous person in Unilocleat, for example, like they're not getting paid by Scripps to like brainstorm on um, ideas. And so, you know, NNA, I listened and they, they had, um, I don't know if they still have it, but they had a planning grant available. So basically a grant that was designed to bring together people for brainstorming uh, on stuff like this. So yeah, I think that that's really important and I'm seeing NSF starting to do that a lot more and um, yeah, I'm in favor of it. Thousand percent, yes. Um, as Sarah said, I am a non-native, I work in a native community, and I get asked at least once a week and probably sometimes once a day to be part of a project. 
And a lot of times it's not intentional. It's a cold call. We want to, inc it, it's, they're not saying it, but they want, they want to increase their chances that they will get funded. Please be part of this. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything. And, and as Sarah said, my institution doesn't care if I write, ever write a paper. They don't care that I'm helping the students, that I'm helping the community, that I'm working with them. Um, we don't have a tenure track system at our institution. Most tribal colleges and universities do not. We're on one-year contracts. Um, it's it's very, very different, but it doesn't mean that it's a lesser academia, right? That's that like academic side eye. Ooh, that means that, you know, we're all professors. We all have PhDs. We're choosing to work in this community. It's just different, but um, a thousand percent, yes. Building those relationships, I think is probably gonna be the most beneficial. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, talk talk a little bit building on what you were talking about that um, extractive or transactional relationships. And um, Sarah, you talked earlier, I think about getting to know the communities. Um, how do we, the ethics around using traditional knowledge because we have rich histories, long histories, thousands of years of history of our coastal ecosystems and um, which can help our modern day science, right? Enrich the history of that space. Um, how do we use that for the good of the community and not for extraction? right and not for misrepresentation there's ethics around doing that but about using traditional knowledges what are your thoughts on that um i would just say that you know i've seen examples of it um where there's been a lot of co-development of research ideas and questions that have incorporated indigenous knowledge into the framework of it. And so, um, but the outcomes of the research that I've seen are going to be directly impactful to the indigenous community that, it, that it's relevant to, if that makes sense. And so, um, and the, yeah, so yeah, I don't wanna like, yeah, I've seen like proposals that have specifically talked about um, an indigenous community is aware of this um, phenomenon happening in their community, you know, related to sea ice extent and um, wind direction. And we're, you know, planning on measuring X, Y, and Z um, using sensors. And the idea here is to um, have better prediction for um, when sea ice is going to thaw or disintegrate. Um, which would be a benefit to the native community because they can have some idea of when um, sea ice will be susceptible to thawing and, and unsafe for using as a platform for hunting. So that would be like an example of a way that, you know, indigenous knowledge was, you know, incorporated into the, um, the framework of like the question design and then, um, but the outcome of the research is um, not just like a paper that's going to be published about the sensor data from, you know, water at different depths, but also there's going to be some benefit to the community because they'll know like, okay, when the wind is blowing in this particular direction, we're going to have like upwelling or whatever that's going to um, destabilize sea ice. So yeah, sorry, that was kind of a meandering answer, but I think like anytime that Indigenous knowledge is utilize, I feel like there has to be, or there should be um, a tangible benefit and outcome for the community that's sharing that information. And, you know, I've also seen instances where um, Indigenous people are included as co-authors on, on papers. And um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how much that is beneficial to them, you know, because like a lot of places, I don't know, like, I don't know that my family particularly cares about the papers that I published, for example, but yeah, I mean, I think that that's definitely a nice way to, um, to attribute um, input, yeah, to people and individuals. Thank you. I think it's really important also to acknowledge the fact that 
um, as a researcher coming into a community, it's not your choice whether they share that traditional or family knowledge. Um, and so one of the things that we do is really focus on data sovereignty and, and traditional knowledge is uh, usually a group of a community's ecological knowledge. And then there's also family knowledge that may be very personal to the family. And I've had other academics ask me, well, what if you need this to be able to do X, Y, and Z? What if that will help the story? And you're like, you, you just don't get it. Like you, if they don't want to share it, then you don't get to have access to it. And it's as simple as that. And I think that can be hard for a lot of people with this push to include indigenous knowledge or, or family knowledge um, into science, because it is extremely beneficial if you have, you know, um, generations of stories about sea ice or about a specific um, fish or, or anything related to ocean sciences, it can be really helpful in understanding kind of these long-term changes that happen. Um, but sometimes you just don't have access to it if people don't want to provide it. And so I really like Sarah's thought that it would be beneficial to the community and to the community members, and then also being able to tell other scientists, them's the breaks. <laughs> Data sovereignty. Sovereignty is for the individual and for the community. So. Great. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Comments, thoughts. All right. Okay, Ken. You may have asked this already, Wendy, to Sarah and to Misty, but do, do either of you have any suggestions of model projects which where things went really well? which we could, which you know you've come across or you were involved with that the committee could benefit from. Um, whether it's a good relationship was built or showed the effectiveness of some best practice that was done um, with Native American communities, anything that um, you would um, could share with us, doesn't have to be today, so that we could include it in our report and as an exemplar of, of how things could be done best. You don't have to answer that now, if, but I, it would be great if you could share anything like that ultimately. Dr. Marco Hatches and Swinomish Nation study on clam gardens. And so there are, I think, three papers that have just come out in the past two years, maybe about that. And so it's reincorporating um, ecological knowledge about where clam gardens were built and how communities use them to um, increase clam harvests, how those communities cared for those clams so that the clams um, came back each year and fed their nations. And it is a good example of working with um, natives in Canada and along the Pacific Northwest and kind of spanning that um, political boundary lines. Great, thank you. Thank you both. Yeah, I just put another one in the chat also. So um, my colleague Amina Shardup was a part of this study and it's basically looking at um, dam development um, impacts on a methylmercury buildup in fish in a Canadian river. And yeah, in this situation, basically uh, the indigenous community reached out to the scientists first um, and asked them to measure methylmercury um, with this, you know, they had already formed the research question themselves. So yeah, I, I'll just, I put it in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kiki. Sarah and Missy, thank you so much for all that you've shared so far. Um, my question is digging into something that you've, uh, both of you have raised several times that the native and indigenous communities, nations, that are in the U.S. and in U.S. territories are many and plural and separate and different. And our charge makes a stab at recognizing that difference with four different terms. But when we get into the actual writing of the study itself, I worry as to how we can show progress in making those differences explicit and real while also making them tractable 
to discuss and deal with um, in the context of this very broad sweeping study. And I'm wondering if you have thoughts on how we could in practice discuss this that shows that indeed we're thinking about it and we're trying to further how this is being handled while also not trying to like try to tackle it all and try to figure out because I don't think we will be able to do it every one individual justice. Like what would be a benchmark, a real benchmark of progress that says this report did it better than the other ones? I would just say that it would be probably really important to state very upfront in the in the report that uh, Native communities and um, groups are not a monolith and that each one has different culture, language, history, lived experiences, um, and then probably go into, you know, themes that exist for individuals or students, um, yeah, from those backgrounds. I think, you know, just being really explicit up front that you're not, you're trying not to place this like umbrella over everyone and, and you're acknowledging that there are differences, but that there are some, some shared experiences that do exist. And I mean, we see it for, um, you know, people of color all throughout academia, there are a lot of shared experiences. And I think just being very upfront about it um, in the report from the get go. Um, because I think if you try to go into the details of like what one community or group experiences versus another, it'll, it would be like a, thousand page report. So that would be my suggestion. I agree. I think one of the things that are missing from some of those reports, it's kind of like assumed that there might be differences, but just the explicit statement that, you know, this is in no way representative of an entire um, demographic of people that, you know, include sovereignty and acknowledgement that um, there's many, many different communities. Can I follow up on that? Um, would it be helpful if we had an appendix, for example, that listed all the tribes, nations, people recognized or unrecognized that are, that view themselves as coastal people to just literally have a list of their names of those groups? Or I, I know that maps are difficult, um, but with something like that where we at least have the names of them if we cannot inscribe their histories as a place where people would start. Um, would that resonate well or would that seem somehow mm, performative or, or, yeah, my th I have a thought in that direction. I just want to get your thoughts, your thoughts on it. I would say no. Um, and the reason I say that is just from the experience I have with my students, where I have students who are not from a Coast Salish tribe or, or an ocean tribe who are not interested in the ocean, engaged in learning. Um, and I worry that it'll be more, it's another barrier. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I, I think like, you know, I was thinking about interior Alaska folks who may be interested in the ocean, but, you know, I, yeah, and then seeing the appendix and not seeing their uh, native affiliation or tribal affiliation listed. Um, yeah, that would be kind of what I'm leaning towards. Thank you. I really appreciate that feedback. All right. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your time and your knowledge and your uh, willingness to talk to us today. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, and thanks to all our speakers today, uh, Manson, Paxton, uh, Amy, Riley, Misty, and Sarah. Um, you guys have really enriched our discussions. Um, we really appreciate it. And thanks to our moderators, um, Wendy and Kiki. Um, I do want to end um, with something we should have started with, um, and that is a land acknowledgement. <laughs> um, so we, uh, Safa, do you want to put it on the screen? Um, so we acknowledge that we gather on the traditional land 
of the Ahashiman and the Tongva peoples, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it through the generations. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. We thank them for their resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities to their example. And with that, um, we close our public session. Um, stay tuned for additional public sessions for our folks online. Um, and a recording of this session will be available on our website in approximately a week. If there's anything you'd like to share with the committee, again, please do reach out. Uh, thank you and have a good day. <laughs>